Yes, Counselor, we are now live. Thank you. Uh, good evening. The time is now five o'clock, and I would like to call the March 16th, 2021 Community of the Whole meeting to order. Uh, first, I would like to ask if there are any additions or deletions to the agenda. Not seeing any, I will move on. Um, we're looking to move to adopt the minutes of the February 16th, 2021 Council meeting minutes. Uh, Mr. Councillor Sperling, would you like to make that motion? Will I move that we approve the minutes of the February 16th, 2021 Committee of the Whole meeting as printed and circulated? Thank you. I will ask if there are any errors or omissions. Seeing none, I'll we'll close the motion. Let's wait for it to come up on your screen and cast your vote. Are we using iPads, Lisa? I'm not getting anything. Um, we are. Councillor Kelly, can you uh, let the services know your vote, please? That's correct. Uh, Councillor Kelly, I don't have you signed in along with Councillor Sperling. I was signed in. I was in the in-camera section. I'm back and I got it. Thank you. And Councillor Sperling, you're in favor? I am, thank you. That is carried unanimously. Uh, moving on, we don't have any delegations registered to speak, so we will be moving to presentations. I'd like to welcome our assessors, Mike Krim of Tanmar Consulting and Larry Horn of IMAC, who will be presenting tonight. But at first, I believe we are starting off with our CFO. Welcome, mm -hmm. Mr. Eamon. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Jeremy Eman, Chief Financial Officer for the City. I am pleased to welcome the City's Property Assessors, Mr. Mike Krim of Tanmark Consulting and Mr. Larry Horn of IMAC Assessment. They are here to present an update on property assessment growth and market value changes impacting the 2021 taxation year. Along with Mr. Krim and Mr. Horn, Shannon Andruko, Senior Accountant, and myself are available to answer questions following the presentation. I'll now invite Mr. Krim to present. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my first question is to find out if you have the presentation loaded up on your screen or do I need to share my screen? Uh, services, do we have it? Minimize that. Share your screen, uh, Mr. Krim. Share it, Kit. Thank you, Mr. Krim. We can see it now. You can see it now. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. All right, I'm here to present to you uh, the outcome of the 2020 assessment for the 2021 tax year. I'm here uh, on behalf of my company, Tanmark Consulting, located in Sherwood Park, and uh, Larry Horn is also here from IMAC. I'm getting right into it. This year, now I just want to also make sure if there's any questions, I've, because I've got two screens here, I'm trying to keep the screen in front of me, so I'm kind of looking at the camera at the same time, and I may not see if anybody lifts their hand for a question. Is that okay to just wait for the end for the questions then, or or just interrupt me if you have a question, maybe? Uh, I will wait till the end. We'll let you finish your presentation. Okay, thank you. So, as a summary, this year we have 11,181 taxable assessment parcels in the city, of which 10,551 are residential and 589 non-residential, and we do have also 41 farmland parcels. 
The total taxable assessed value for the city now is 6.37 billion. Um, 3.48 billion of that is in residential assessment and 2.89 billion of that is in non-residential assess, uh, assessment. And in that 2.89 billion, we do have some designated industrial assessment. Larry's gonna talk about that in a bit. Approximately 1.6 billion of designated industrial. And then we have about 525 million of heavy industrial that's non-designated um, industrial. And uh, also 761 million roughly of commercial and light industrial assessed value. We are now reflecting a July 1 of 2020 valuation date. That is a date that's legislated by the provincial government and we have to use that every year. So every year that July 1 moves forward another year. Last year was based on July of 19, or 2019. This year it's July of 2020. And what we saw on the single family assessment side was a decrease of about two and a half percent. So market values did drop in that time frame. Um, and we're now at an average of about 375,700 assessment value on a single family property. The other uh, property types in residential, for example, duplexes and triplexes, uh, attached homes decreased similarly to about one point or of about 1.9% to an average assessment of $281,200. And the average assessed value now for a condominium in the city is about 190,400, a decrease of about 4.3%. I've included a, an aerial map showing the change by neighborhood for single family detached homes. I won't go through each and every one of these, but you can see a uh, quick glance that you know we've got some values that went down just under uh one percent clover park 0 0.6 percent and others that went down about 4.3 percent for example south board village everything else seems to fall in between averaging again that two and a half percent decrease this chart shows that we have approximately 85.59% of single family properties in the city changed between zero and negative 5%. We did a comparison or, or a quick um, survey with other jurisdictions in and around Edmonton and found that the 2.5% in Fort Saskatchewan is pretty close to some of the other jurisdictions as well. You can see here St. Albert down to 1.9. Stony Plain down 3.5, Spruce Grove 4.2, Devon 1.9, Edmonton 2.4, Sherwood Park minus 1%, Beaumont minus 2.7%, and Leduc minus 3%. <coughs> Sorry. On the multi residential side, so we're talking uh, typically low rise apartments in this slide. Apartment buildings were down 4.9%, and that compares well with most of the uh, jurisdictions in the area. Edmonton saw a bigger decrease than, than some of the other ones, minus 9.0%, but the rest of them were kind of in that 4 or 5% decrease. On the commercial and light industrial side, we saw a downtown commercial with an average assessment decrease of about 4.5%. Highway commercial went down Average assessment of about 4.9%. Hotels were hit especially hard during the pandemic with uh, decreased occupancies and revenue per available room. The average assessment decrease on the, on the hotels this year is about 26%. And other municipalities in the area did drop as well, 10% to 42%. 42% was noticed in Edmonton this year on hotel property. And on the light industrial side, about 6.9% decrease. For assessment growth, we saw a total residential assessment growth value of about 55.8 million, and that was found in roughly 92 single family and 40 new du duplex dwellings added to the roll. We also had some previous builds from 2019 that were progressive in 2019 that are now complete. We made some updates due to renovations and other changes that we that we were able to uh, find on the assessment in the during the assessment cycle. And we also had 84 new residential lots in Southport Meadows and in Windsor Point.
on the non-residential side, we had a total growth of about 11.7 million. And that included new construction uh, in South Point. There's some highly commercial and K. Gregor Chemical added a new building. And there were some previous progressive builds that are now complete. We also had some heavy industrial growth that is included in that 11.7 million. That we've got some information coming up in, in a couple slides from now. And here's where I'll let Larry take off or take over since uh, he's the designated industrial expert. We just can't hear you, Larry. Can you unmute yourself? By God, apologize for that. Thank you very much, Mike. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to meet with you all. Uh, just a little update on the uh, designated industrial properties. They are a little unlike the properties that Mike was going over with you is that they are not driven by market value. They are driven as special properties and are assessed according to the minister's guidelines. So having said that, uh, there were several uh, properties that were sent back to the local assessor from the province and uh, those were deemed not to meet the dip criteria. The dip criteria being strictly oil and gas, and a lot of these were that were sent back were um, um, were fertilizer or farming type um, um, facilities. So those didn't qualify, and they were sent back. Um, all dip properties are fully integrated and assessed by the provincial assessor's office uh, starting July fourth, two thousand and twenty one. They had originally um, extended the contract for us to complete the assessments for 2021. However, there was a few other municipalities that the um, provincial assessor decided they could handle the workload and they've taken them over as of July 4th. The growth in industrial, heavy industrial is uh, the two major ones, Kiera and Dow the power utility specifically at the Dow site. The non-designated industrial property growth were for the Corafco, um, Oricon, Metco, Nutrien, Sherit, Praxair. Um, those didn't have anything major. There were a lot of annual turnaround improvements that they do annually, and we pick those up on a regular basis. Future projects, their major project at Dow is uh, anticipated this coming year. However, our meeting with all these uh, facilities and the managers, a lot of the projects were either put on hold, shelved, or canceled. So uh, even though they have them on the books, it's not necessarily that they will go ahead. And then there are some smaller projects at Kiera. We picked up uh, the major projects a couple of years ago at Kiera. So anyways, at, at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And uh, that's it for the heavy industrial. Turn it back to Mike. Thanks, Larry. OK. So overall, this is a, a table showing the total assessment between 2019. Sorry, it should say 2020 tax year, 2021 tax year. Um, growth of about 1%, 67 and a half million and deflation overall of about 2.58% or negative 166,820,000. These areas were the areas we concentrated on for the assessment review last year. We typically, well, we need to look at uh, a review of about 20% of the taxable properties on a yearly basis. And these are the two areas that we looked at as part of our cycle, they came into the five year cycle. It had been five years before they since they were looked at last. And in 2020, as in previous years, we sent out with the help from the city staff. Um, residential survey questionnaires to all of those properties, uh, just under 1900 properties in those areas. And we actually received about a 70% response rate, which is excellent. Uh, previous years were 65, 70% as well. So we're getting really good information. We're getting really good response rate back. And uh, 
we're going to keep continue moving forward with this. And in fact, with the pandemic, it, it was actually a necessity that uh, we did this. And I'm glad that we were ahead of the curve a little bit and that we'd already been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, not knocking on doors anymore and people really don't walk, want us knocking on too many doors anyway. So this has turned into a really good way of getting the information that we've always needed in the past anyways. And here's the summary of uh, what I was just talking about. Um, just under 1900 requests sent. We're asking for interior information, including bathrooms, fireplaces, type of flooring, any renovations, windows, doors, siding. And there you can see that 70% response rate that we did receive. Uh, what's next? Approval of the property tax bylaw, mailing of assessment notices, and we will get and field ratepayer and tax agent inquiries as always. And we'll do inspections and reassessments as required. If necessary, we'll have assessment review board hearings. And we're also going to be starting the next cycle of assessment requests, including on non res multifamily hotels and residential. And that concludes it. So I'll try and unshare. I could figure that out. Thank you for your presentations. Um, so we'll move on to the round table while you're taking that down. Thanks, Mike. And uh, first up for questions on discussion is Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation. Um, actually, my question comes to the last slide. It says 2020 assessment review area. You talked about 1,880 requests for information sent out, and it looks like it's just a questionnaire around more detailed information on a residential property, and that you had 70% response rate. What if you didn't respond to that survey? Yeah, so the original uh, mailer went out, and, and I'm, I'm not remembering the date exactly, but I think it was... May or June, and then we waited a couple months, three months, and sent out a reminder to those that didn't respond. And then the ones that didn't respond after that did get a quick drive by to check for any outside renovations that we might have been able to identify and uh, and make a change on the assessment. Okay, and the purpose of this was to identify uh, other improvements in the home and that might increase value. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Moving on, Mayor Ketcher. Great, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just going to go to Larry. So on your future projects, you've got the Dow Furnace. So um, I'm anticipating we'll see that as of, um, is that on coming on like 2021 or 2022? Do we know? Once again, as I mentioned, it should be coming on, I believe this year, but the way things are right now, and uh, nobody will commit to any timelines. And of course, you know, the rules are a little bit different for industrial, just bringing up to speed on that. It's as of October 31st, not December 31st, as is the case for every other type of property. The province changed that. So by uh, quite often, they, even if they're close to being done, they often don't get done until after October 31st, which means it cannot be assessed until the following year. Just a little bit of a loophole, I guess you would call it. So um, I highly anticipate it being completed, but once again, we can get nothing uh, confirmed from them. Okay, thank you. And my next question yeah. is to Mike on residential. So people or citizens have a difficult time when they get their tax notice and they don't understand assessment versus taxation and how they tie together. Um, I guess when you send your notification out, do you send any education uh, information out with them? Because I mean, we typically have to rely on just doing public engagement and letting people know, you know, try and come online and try and educate people. But is there ever any, pub, uh, any education you can do? Because people don't understand the difference. Yeah, there's, there's, I believe that the uh, the city has sent out inserts in the tax notices in the past assessment and tax notice combination in the past. 
that gives a little bit of background on assessment. I know that the City of Fort Saskatchewan website also has some information. Our website has some information and we're always open to anybody giving us a call at any time and, and answering any questions that they might have on assessment and taxation. You know, we don't want to answer as many questions on the tax side of things, but certainly on the assessment side of things. Okay, Jeremy, do you just want to confirm what you do? Uh, yes, um, through Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mike is right that we, we do a pretty comprehensive tax insert that goes in with the tax notice, um, advising taxpayers of deadlines where they can pay that sort of thing. Um, and I think there's also some information about um, if they have, you know, a complaint with their assessment, who to contact, they, they contact usually Mike's office directly. And, and if there are questions of taxation, then we're, we're happy to help with that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lennox. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, for instance, I read an article, I, I think the other yesterday or the day before, that they're anticipating a huge leap in in housing prices, um, like by 21%. And so I'm just wondering what, I guess, if anything, there are there any kind of measures in place to kind of mitigate big fluctuations in assessments? Um, is that just something that we take as it comes or how can you provide some insight on how that works? Yeah, um, it's a good question. And I'm reminded of when we went through a fairly significant increase in value back in 2007, 2008, roughly in that time where property values pretty much doubled over a period of two years. We don't have a choice as assessors but to follow that market. And so we did uh, increase assessments by, you know, roughly double over that two year time frame. They also came down fairly quickly after everything stopped and we had to, re you know, look at it going the other way as well. So there's no way that we can mitigate as assessors what happens uh, with market values. If they go up by that much, we have to follow it. Great. Okay. Um, and just in your chart there for the sing single family detached homes, it has compared by percentage change. And it has more than 10% um, with a 2.3% um, of, I'm not sure who, if, can you provide some background as to who in the community um, was subject to a, more than 10%? So that would, that would be the properties that are new construction or construction that was progressive. Uh, it was still under construction as of December 31st, 2019, that is now assessed as complete. And so on that chart, there's 155 properties uh, that received a significant increase in it. I'm, you know, 99% of those properties would be because of new construction. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, hey, uh, it's my turn in the rotation. Um... I'll just start going back to your assessment review area. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. It does look like just residential review. Um, how do you cycle out uh, the non-residential? What do you do? How often do you look at those? And what is the cycle for that? So I'm just pulling it up now on my other screen. <clears throat> It is, it's, if non-residential does get the same um, one every five year look. And I'm just, uh, there were some done in 2019. Just trying to see if it was all done in 2019. Yeah, it looks like most of it was done in 2019. And then we also, on a yearly basis, collect rental data, income data from uh, commercial and multifamily landlords. So we're keeping up with the commercial side of this, actually more than the obligatory 20% per year. The 20%, we're actually physically going, uh, driving by those properties and seeing if there's anything that stands out that isn't reflected on the assessment. Thank you. Um, my next question is, can you just talk a little bit about what factors make the difference between municipalities? Um, 
where like one municipality in our area is subject to minus 4.3 on average, we're around 2.5. What are the differences in, in those big spins between municipalities? You know, when it comes to market values, we really just have to follow what the marketplace shows us. So we get those sales on a yearly basis, and if they show us that it's a two and a half percent decrease in a year, then that's what gets reflected on the assessment. And it and it will vary between municipality because every municipality has uh, different aspects to their market. They have different housing types in their market. Some proper some municipalities have uh, an abundance or a majority of newer properties versus older properties, and you know people's perceptions and wants and needs per municipality are a little bit different. So it really just amounts to what is shown to us in the marketplace. And this year we might be a little bit less than a couple of those other municipalities for decrease in assessment, but in other years we've been more than the uh, average assessment change than some of those other municipalities. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, you're next. Yes, thank you, Ben. Thank you, gentlemen, for your report. It sticks in my mind that over the last few years, hotels have seen rather significant drops. So what's the, Mike, what's the cumulative drop in assessed value for the average hotel in Port Saskatchewan? And it's just out of curiosity. I'll just pull this up. It'll take me a second here. I'm just taking an average assessment from an average uh, hotel or, or. I do think we had a one year where they were down 40% a couple of years ago, for instance. Okay, on this specific hotel, for example, I won't, I won't, I won't, you know, say which one it is, but it is a, we'll call it an upper end hotel in, in the city. It's dropped more than half. So it's a it's a, about a fifty five percent drop since the two thousand and seventeen tax year. So in four years, a fifty five percent drop in value. Wow, life for the hotel owners isn't good lately. No. Um, I'd like to just ask a couple informative information questions on the designated industrial property aspect. Were there any, in a, in a briefly, any significant changes in the assessment practices or guidelines for designated industrial property under the new regime? You already mentioned the, the October 31 cutoff. Anything over and above that, Larry? Yes, uh, thank you. It that's the major one is that they wanted to line the industrial designated industrial properties up with the linear properties which are already had in october 31st as far as the other um, <clears throat> rules that we follow everything is exactly the same they have got uh, another replacement uh, for the ccrg which is the cost reporting guide and it's ripa but they haven't actually got that completed so that will bring on some new rules theoretically however that has not been able to make it through the through the review process so other than that it's you know the municipal government act is our our starting bible and we work our way through the minister's guidelines and all the supporting uh documents that we are required to follow so as far as uh, designated properties they're pretty well special they're all considered special properties that's why they don't follow the market they follow a the specific formulas and rates that are published by the minister's guidelines. Thank you, Larry. And one more question, if I may. What's the distinction then in it, it, for a non-designated industry? You mentioned fertilizer and farming. That's uh, obvious, or I shouldn't say obvious, but easy to understand. Is there anything else that, that would fall into that? that? That's the general rule of thumb that they've given us. Every now and then they may take an extra property or facility that they deem to be something they want to look after. Uh, they have complete control over that, and uh, we have very little input from time of when they actually do that. But basically, the split is is that if it's not oil and gas regulated uh, type of facility, then it's not 
uh, going to be designated industrial property. It becomes non-designated industrial property. And that usually uh, is anything like fertilizer, cement facilities, cement manufacturing facilities or concrete plants and these kinds of things. Anything that's not directly um, regulated by the uh, AU, AU or any of the other boards. That's, you, that's the rule of thumb. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do have a couple more questions um, for the next rotation. Thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Uh, my first question is around um, farmlands. Um, I do know that the annexation wasn't completed until January 1st of 2020, and I was expecting to see a lot bigger um, growth in farmland. And I'm just, just wondering why and what happened there. So farmland isn't assessed at market value, it's assessed at agricultural use value. So while you might think that with a, a fairly good size annexation, there'd be a lot of market value in that farmland. There is market value in the farmland, but it's not assessed on that. Uh, agricultural use value is something substantially less than market value, like pennies on the dollar. So that's why you wouldn't have seen such a, uh, a big increase in that in that farmland value. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so my other question, you kind of answered my question, the other question, Larry, but I just wanted to know, because you talked about the guidelines that um, will be, um, the province is going to be releasing for the designated um, industrial properties. Um, do we have a timeline on, on, on when that's going to be released? Well, you're, you're referring, hey, thank you, the, you're referring to RIPA, but it's been on the books. It was supposed to be released last year. So um, once again, they will release it when they're ready to release it, and they haven't really given us a hard hard date at all. Great, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Councilor Harris. Mike, I don't have any questions on your report. I thought it was uh, pretty comprehensive, and I understood that. Uh, the question I've got in general terms is, um, looking forward, do you see the market activity that's taking place residentially boating well in the future? for the assessed value for residential properties? I had a quick look actually just today on uh, the more recent sales since July of 2020 to the end of uh, February, and there's been an increase in single family dwelling properties, roughly 2% since that time so far. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Okay, uh, we're on to round two. Councillor Sperling, do you have any further questions? You're good. Kate Mayor Ketcher. Councillor Lennox. I do. Maybe to uh, Mr. Eman, if I'm not sure um, if you'll have the information, but I'm just wondering if you can provide some information about what the current uh, split non residential and residential um, taxation is. At one point, it was, I think it was 60 40. I'm um, just wondering if you can, if you have any comments on that. I think you're on mute, Jeremy. I apologize. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Lennox. Um, the looking at the tax split, which is of course one factor among many, um, according to uh, the property tax um, policy that we follow. Um, I'm just looking it up here really quickly. I don't think it's changed significantly um, over the past several years because it is dependent upon growth in the residential and non-residential sectors. Um, I'm just looking it up. It's still approximately about 59.41 or 60.40 is what it's been in, in quoted in past years. So it hasn't, sorry, it hasn't changed significantly. Can you, are you able to, um, like what, Percent or how many residential units would have to be built out in order to change that percentage of split? Are you able to calculate that? Uh, through Madam Chair, it's it's not essentially the number of units. It's it's dollar values. It's dollars in assessment. And one relatively large industrial um, or commercial property that gets added could significantly sway the non-residential sector. Um, whereas a you know a new neighborhood and growth in the residential areas, what what would really shift it towards the residential side? So it 
it, it's typically doesn't come down to the number of units. It's, it's significant growth in terms of, of, of great residential neighborhoods or a large industrial or commercial venture. Okay, but at some point, if we if there's a, a continuous build of residential and there's no um, access or excess non-residential, then that will obviously naturally shift. That is correct. Yes. And so what we've seen in the, in the past, um, there was a number of years um, where there was strong non-residential growth, um, which pulled the, uh, the non-residential growth upwards, but we've seen that decline obviously in the last few years. So the, the split has um, stayed fairly consistent over the past at least five years, I would say. Okay, thank you. It's back to me. Uh, most of my questions have been asked. I just have a fairly big one to ask at the end here. Mr. Eman, this one will be to you. So with an overall decrease across the city, across commercial and residential, um, what can residents expect? Because we've passed a 0% budget, and I know that a lot of people will feel that means that their taxes are not going to go up, but with an overall decrease, um, wouldn't that reflect that everyone's will go up somewhat? Uh, thank you for the question, Madam Chair. Um, the best way to answer that would be that, again, with respect to the individual property owner, be it a residential or non-residential, whether or not their tax um, bill will go up this year is really dependent upon where they sit amongst the market adjustments throughout their class. So, for example, um, the residential um, properties that uh, that Mike uh, referred to in those neighborhoods that saw a lesser um, decrease in market value relative to the average could be looking at a slight increase over last year, only because their market value is less than the average. And similarly, if um, if there's some areas of the of the city and residential that actually went uh, declined more than the average, they would see a decrease. But the important thing to remember is that uh, we have no control over the individual assessments, but the budget is what it is, and that relayed in 0% increase in tax revenue. So again, how that spread across the assessment base is really up to the individual properties, and, and, and it's going to be different. We can only quote on what it looks like for the average, and that's looking at a 0%. I hope that answers your question. It's 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 never an easy question to answer. I'll think about it, and uh, I may send some follow up via email. Um, Councillor Kelly, I'm to you. You bet. Thank you, uh, Councillor Macon. I'm going to follow up on that line of questioning, but I'm uh, going to direct my questions to Mr. Krim. Can you describe for Council, please, Mike, the one or the largest percentage increase of property with an experience, the largest increase in its assessed value, non-construction related, so inflation related for both residential and non-residential and what that change was. That, if I'm understanding you, and thank you for the question, if I'm understanding it, that would reflect on uh, the fourth slide that I have showing that Southport Village had, nope, sorry, Clover Park had the least amount of deflationary assessment change. So where the average was minus 2.5%, Clover Park was minus 0.6%. Is, no, is that what you're looking for? I'm sorry, it's, I didn't explain myself well. I'm not looking for groupings. I'm looking for the identification of an individual property or properties. So, so it might be that one commercial property had an increase in assessed value, non-construction related that far exceeded the rest. Can you describe that situation? And likewise for the residential. Okay, if, if you, uh, thanks for the question. If you're looking for an individual property, I would have to pull that out by doing a bit more research, but on a general basis, it can happen where a property value increases residentially, for example, if 
for example, we find out through our inspection or otherwise, maybe one of the surveys that they've got a fully developed basement that we didn't have assessed before would be one scenario. On the non-residential side, uh, similarly, if there was some growth, but you're not, are you talking growth or just the inflation probably? I'm talking the percentage increase in assessed value. What was the largest single percentage increase in a property that you witnessed this year, both residential and non-residential? I don't have that on me. I would have to do a bit of digging to pull that out. I'm sorry. Can you get that for council, please? I can do that. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. Councillor Keller. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Batoy, do you have any further questions? Okay. Councillor Harris. Nothing. Thanks. All right. I think that that. Oh, uh, go ahead, Councillor Sterling. Just a really quick question, and I'll pose it to Mr. Eman. There was a new uh, business class created under the MGA for a third category uh, of taxation, and that was for small business. And I'm wondering what it would, uh, when and if that uh, class will come into effect. When will that uh, taxation uh, program be created, or what would trigger that taxation program? Uh, thanks for the question through Madam Chair. Um, that was announced, I think, through a change in the MGA a couple of years now. Sorry, I, I don't remember the exact year. Um, and I think that what it allowed um, municipalities to do or councils of municipalities is to further break down the non-residential class into another class. Right now, it's, it's, it's grouping together machinery equipment and all non-residential under one grouping. Um, the idea was that um, Council could um, create a small business class or even a large business class um, if they wanted to. It just allowed further flexibility in doing so. As far as we know, um, and maybe Mike can uh, respond to that, but as far as we know, there's been no municipalities that have actually um, taken on that and added that separate class within the non res. Um, I don't know if Mike, if, if you have any more information on that. I do. Thank you. Um, in fact, there are a number of municipalities that have implemented a small business class. I am the appointed assessor in one of those municipalities, County of Vermilion River. And uh, just a brief uh, synopsis. The, the municipality has to create a, a, a small business bylaw and specify within that bylaw the type of property that would qualify for small business. In the act and regulations, it allows for a uh, small business to be any type of business that has, and, and I'm just going off memory here right now, but uh, 50 full time employees or less across Canada could qualify for small business. My municipality and others have created a bylaw that has changed that a little bit. And in fact, within that bylaw, it's the number is 10 uh, full time employees or less across Canada. Those are the ones that qualify. So we maintain that with the County of Vermilion River and uh, and it's 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 gone well so far. The difference in tax rates that can be applied between the non-res and the small business class is not a great difference. And uh, you know, I'd have to do some research on that as well as to how much difference there's, but it's not a big difference. Is there a benefit to small business? If it's implemented, there's a small benefit to small business within that framework. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll just look for a quick show of hands. If anyone else needs a round three, not seeing any, uh, to thank Mike Prim and Larry Horn for our assessors for coming out tonight. I am the council representative on Crafts Capital Region Assessment Service Commission. And I do know uh, from having sat on there the last three years that we have an extremely low amount of um, cases that actually go to a hearing. So I think that that is, uh, shows a job well done. So we appreciate your hard work, gentlemen, and thank you for coming out tonight. And you as well, Mr. Eman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is land use bylaw amendments that facilitate the repurposing of hotel and motel sites. And we have Matthew Siddons and Craig Thomas presenting. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Yes, I think we can. So I'm Matthew Sins, I'm current planner, and I'm here with Craig Thomas, Director of Planning and Development. And today we are presenting our findings regarding land use bylaw amendments that may facilitate the repurposing of hotels and hotel sites in the city. So to start off, uh, this presentation provides an overview of the following. Uh, the current situation in Fort Saskatchewan, so an overview of hotels and motels in the city, uh, the current land use bylaw, examples from other municipalities of hotel repurposing, uh, considerations for repurposing hotels, upcoming planning initiatives, and next steps. So the city has a population of approximately 27,000 residents and has 12 hotels. The majority of the hotels are clustered along the highway corridor. This table compares the number of hotels in regional municipalities. For comparison, Sherwood Park has a population of approximately 70,000 residents and has nine hotels. St. Albert has a population of 66,000 residents and five hotels. Most hotels are located in the C2 Commercial and Retail Service District. This district is intended for vehicular oriented commercial developments. Features of highway commercial developments are standalone buildings, drive throughs and parking lots. C2 district currently does not allow for residential uses or assisted living facilities. 2020 council approved the Ross Creek crossing direct control district. This land use bylaw amendment was initiated by the property owner. This district permits mixed use developments with compatible commercial and residential uses. And the existing two hotels on the site can be repurposed for residential uses. So this shows um, examples from other municipalities for the repurposing of hotels. So this is an ongoing issue in the Edmonton region and nationally. Now our review of other municipalities, we found that hotels are typically located in two locations, in downtowns where hotels are used for business travel and conferences, and along highways to accommodate uh, travelers by cars. Characteristics of highway hotel sites are they're located along major roadways, they serve a regional area, uh, they're accessible by car, and they have ample on-site parking. 2020, Edmonton approved land use bylaw amendments that enabled the development of supportive housing with any zones that allow hotels. The CHY Highway Corridor Zone, which is similar to our C2 district, permits commercial developments with limited residential uses along roadways. This district includes regulations. This district includes regulations that require building setbacks and screening developments abutting residential uses. In downtown Edmonton, there are examples of high-rise hotels that have been converted to apartments. Former Capilano Inn was converted to the King's University, is a post-secondary education facility for 910 students, and this was the only example of non-residential conversion we could find in Edmonton. St. Albert has the RC Regional Commercial District. This district enables high-quality commercial developments that serve both the regional and local context. It is intended for large-scale commercial sites, but emphasizes the pedestrian experience. Uh, this district allows for residential above ground floor commercial uses, and Bellevue Village, shown here, and located south of the Holes in Joyce Center, is an example of a residential development in the RC district. Example of a hotel being repurposed in downtown Red Deer is a Baymont by Wyndham Hotel. This hotel currently has 223 rooms and nine, 109 of these rooms are currently being converted to rental suites. And renters within, renters 
at the site would have access to on-site amenities, including the fitness room and games room. 2019, the former Peninsula Hotel in Niagara Falls, Ontario was converted to the Chapel Heights Seniors Community. This is an assisted living facility with 82 suites. Amenities include a fitness center, pool, and activity rooms. The site is located adjacent to the Queen Elizabeth Highway and is north of the Niagara Square Shopping Center. Current consideration Okay, uh, current consideration, sorry about that, uh, considerations for repurposing hotels. Now we'll look at considerations for land use bylaw amendments, uh, which can be done either in the short term or with the new land use bylaw. Current considerations include change in use, change in use and alteration development permits, site-specific direct control districts, and a C2 district with compatible residential uses. As part of the new land use bylaw, these, feature, these are future considerations, reimagining the highway corridor district and creating a new mixed use district within the land use bylaw. So a current consideration is a change of use and alteration development permit. The applicant would submit a development permit uh, to the city uh, strengths of this option include that applicants can apply for any use in the C2 district. The permit application period is approximately four to six weeks, and it does not require any amendments to the land use bylaw. Considerations for this option include that it only applies to uses within the C2 district. Uh, residential use is not currently allowed in C2 district, and existing uses are generally not conducive to the repurposing of hotels in this district. A second consideration are site-specific direct control districts. This option is also applicant initiated. Strengths of this option include that the district is site-specific and the district can reflect the unique characteristics of the site. Considerations of this option include that it requires a land use bylaw amendment, which is a three to four month process and direct control districts have a longer review period compared to standard amendments. A third option is creating a residential, residential compatible C2 district. Strengths of this option include, it adds policies that support residential developments in the C2 district. It helps to create compatibility between commercial and residential developments. And considerations of this option include that if considered, it would be administratively or initiated by the applicant. The city would need to develop a site evaluation criteria and research best practices on how residential uses can be incorporated into commercial districts. Regulations regarding commercial and residential interfaces need to be addressed. And this district could be similar to St. Albert's RC district. As an implementation tool of the Municipal Development Plan, administration is undertaking a comprehensive review of the land use bylaw, which will involve looking at different regulatory approaches to best achieve the goals of the MVP. That initiative would include uh, the Commercial Corridor District. The timeline for this initiative is that research and background work would occur this year, and the initial draft is anticipated in 2022. Two considerations would be a reimagined highway commercial corridor district and the creation of mixed use district. So I'll first talk about the imagining the highway corridor district. Uh, strengths of this option include that creating a new highway corridor district for commercial uses um, that are compatible with residential uses. It can be applied to multiple sites along the corridor and it supports the redevelopment of commercial sites. Considerations of this option include that the city would draft the district and determine the required regulations. The new district can be drafted in consultation with the community and hotel industry, and they can be adopted as part of the new land use bylaw. Another planning initiative is the creation of a mixed use district. Such a district would be separate from the highway commercial districts. Strengths of this option include that a new mixed-use district would allow 
commercial for commercial and residential developments. Uh, it would provide residential amenities within walking distance. And it provides land use compatibility considerations of this option include that it can be applied to a cluster of hotel sites uh, would only comp comprise a portion of the highway corridor. The new district can be drafted in consultation with the community and the hotel industry. And it can be adopted as part of the new land use bylaw. For next steps, uh, this report can serve as a guide for proponents considering repurposing hotel and motel sites in the city. And phase one of the new land use bylaw is currently underway. I'd like to take this time to answer any questions. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Simmons. Uh, going to Mayor Catcher is first on the rotation. Great. Thank you very much for your presentation. So um, this is really good to see this, and I know this came about uh, due to a notice of motion. Um, I guess the, the question that I have is: so we currently have um, the one greenfield uh, across by Ross Creek that uh, is already changed their designation. And uh, it's my understanding what we have another application that's coming before council at some time. Uh, to your worship, that is correct. So uh, last year, a uh, direct control district was approved for the sites in the Ross Creek crossing area. So for two hotels in that area, and, and the applicant there was looking at um, converting one to assisted living facility and administration uh, has received an application for another direct control district uh, for two hotel sites uh, along the highway in a different area. And this um, application is currently under review. Okay, so I guess the question that I have is, so we've got one done, we've got another one that's potentially in the works, and I'm not sure how many hotels that will take in. But I guess the question um, that I would have for administration is, if you don't have any other applications in at this point in time, um, is it just better off to uh, allow these applications to come forward and deal with a one, one by one um, so that we can deal with them if you're not hearing from any other uh, hotels at this point in time? Uh, like, through, like through I'm me. assuming there's not a rush because the other ones haven't come forward. Mm -hmm. uh, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, your worship. Um, yeah, so right now the uh, proponent would have a couple of options that are available to them. They would always have the right to apply for uh, a direct control site specific districting, uh, which was the case in, uh, in the Ross Creek. Um, another option that would be available to a proponent or, or perhaps could include a group of hotel uh, owners would be to amend the land use bylaw to include residential uses within the C2 district. For administration to support that particular option, we would want to ensure that any residential related uses are going to be compatible with other uses. Um, so therefore we would wanna see provisions that uh, would, include, <clears throat> would include residential amenities, walkability, and appropriate uh, design considerations. Um, so that would also be available to a proponent. And again, that could, could include a group that would be something that the hotel industry could work together on with administration. Um, this option, like uh, Mr. Siddons mentioned, would take a little bit longer um, because we would want to ensure that the affected property owners uh, that already exist within the C2 district uh, as well as other stakeholders would be consul uh, consulted because if we're adding regulations to the C2 district, it's obviously going to impact existing businesses. So that process would be a little bit more robust. It would be more robust than um, a proponent coming forward to deal with a site specific district. Um, I guess a, another option beyond that is administration. We could be more proactive as administration uh, where we would lead that uh, process. Um, it would still take a little bit longer because we would have to go through the same consultation process. Um, part of the issue with that is it's not part of our 2021 work plan. 
and uh, we we would not have the resources in house to deal with that. So we would probably need some funding to carry out that project. Okay, so I guess I would ask Mr. Fleming then. So if council were supporting this, then uh, you would come forward. With, oh, there you are. You would come forward with a request uh, for funding to do something. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to you, Madam Chair, just. Just to sum up where what we recommend with this report in case we weren't uh, clear. So we did the research on on what the options were and we presented a few different options in the report. But since we started that work, two hotels have come forward on different occasions and applied for DCs. And uh, just to be clear, one of the options in the report is allow the individual hotel owners to come forward and apply for direct control districts. And I. I think that's what we're recommending going forward is rather than take a holistic approach is allow the individual hotel owners to apply and then we can evaluate their in their unique circumstances one by one. Um, when we first started on this journey, we think we thought there might have been other ways, easier ways to do it. But I think what we've learned through the research is this is the best way. So really what we're saying today is we don't recommend council take any action. Um, at this time, and instead, um, you would take action when each individual application comes forward for a DC. So, just to sum up, we're not recommending um, that council. Our recommendation here is to simply go with the status quo of what's been done the last uh, the last few months. Okay, thank you. A little more plain English. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I may have questions later. Thank you, Councilor Lennox. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if it feels, I agree with the approach that uh, I think that it should be brought to council on a case by case basis. Um, because of what I worry about is, is obviously the city had a vision for the C2 district and for the highway corridor and what that would look like. And my concern is that if we try and kind of you know, piecemeal it a little bit that we won't necessarily see maybe what some of the unintended outcomes of that might be. And so you've provided some examples from Edmonton and, and Red Deer and, and Calgary and Ontario, maybe. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any examples of anywhere that is more in alignment with our population and with um, our current circumstances. Through your, uh, through, Mad through uh, uh, Madam Chair to uh, Councillor Lennox. So we did take a look at different regional examples. So in terms of the conversions, uh, we did take a look at like some in Edmonton as well as um, other municipalities. It did seem that a lot, um, a lot of the conversions did happen in downtown areas. I think it just might be because those conversions are more publicized. I think there's conversions that happen in smaller municipalities, but it's just, um, it's probably not shared as much in the news or these conversions uh, kind of happen, but they're not as publicized as much. But I think the example from Niagara was good in that it was kind of a smaller, uh, it was a hotel basically, and it got um, transitioned to assisted living facility. And that example, um, is relatable to our uh, C2 district in that it's along um, a highway as well, and it's, the site is adjacent to like a, shop, a shopping mall district, but they're able to redevelop the site and provide amenities that serve the residents there. Uh, Madam Chair, if I could just add to that. Um, one thing that we did recognize through our research is that I guess this phenomenon is is fairly recent um, simply because people aren't traveling um, very much with the pandemic. Uh, we did reach out to uh, Leduc and Leduc County um, because they're going through a very similar uh, issue that uh, Fort Saskatchewan is going with because nobody's traveling to the airport. Um, so it is something that they're considering. I don't think that they've really done the amount of work that we've done. A lot of the municipalities that we've talked to have recognized it's an issue, 
Um, but there's actually been fairly few that um, have started to uh, actually take action and do something about it. So the examples that we've provided um, are really the only examples um, that exist within the province. And then we didn't look too far outside of the province, but Matt did provide that one in uh, Niagara. So I want to guess just to maybe follow up on Mayor Catcher's um, questions. So would you say that the demand for this type of um, adjustment or change in in district is that something do you feel is kind of dwindled because of the circumstances of the vaccines are starting to get rolled out and um, or do you feel like this is something that this industry really needs and wants in this moment and in the long term? Um, through you, Madam Chair, I think I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think what what we're going to start to see, and, and particularly in Fort Saskatchewan, um, because I think you know the ratio of hotels that we have are are fairly disproportionate in terms of our population. Um, so I think it's prudent for us to acknowledge that within our land use planning uh, documents. Um, so one of the considerations that was outlined in the report is taking a more holistic approach or or look at the highway commercial district and you know because i think if we're considering maybe some of the trends in in retail as well and what some of the other municipalities are doing in terms of highway commercial type uses i think it does make sense to look at how residential related uses could be incorporated into um, highway corridor areas, um, but doing it in such a way that it is going to be compatible and those uses have access to appropriate amenities. Um, so that is something that we'll likely be looking at, at least thinking about when we're looking at our land use bylaw. Um, but like we did outline in the report, there are a few things that we could do in the short term and the medium term as well. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I am next on the list. Um, so my question is about um, what is food in this district. So the one thing that jumped out at me was when we. Um, this might be a weird side topic, <laughs> but when we when we talked about the cannabis um, bylaw and where that was going to be allowed and it being allowed in the C2, part of that was its relation to residential and the fact that it wasn't going to be where residential was. So I guess, can you just speak to whether or not that's been a consideration or whether or not... Um, I know what the intent of the one that we've approved of is for, but the one that's coming up, do you expect that to be an adult only residence? Um, and can you speak to maybe whether or not you've considered that as other applications might come forward? Um, yeah, so Madam Chair, that's actually a, a great question because it is gonna be a, a topic that's sort of coming up next week uh, at council as well. Um, but, I guess the the short answer to that is we're not there yet in terms of our consideration. Anytime we're looking at uh, introducing sensitive land uses into a district, uh, we want to look at land use compatibility. So if uh, if if the cannabis type uses are a consideration in that, then that's something that we'll have to navigate through as part of that process. In terms of those uses being like age restrictive or um, restrictive in any way in terms of it regulating the people that are living with inside of those uses, uh, we have to be very careful because that actually goes against legislation. Um, so we can we can regulate use, but we can't regulate the use inside of it. So we have to give considerations to things like adult housing and um, you know assisted living and those sorts of things so there has to be a particular land use 
implication, I guess, that's associated with that use to differentiate it from another use. Um, but like I say, we wouldn't be able to discriminate on age. That's your response. Councillor Kelly? Yes, thank you. Um, just by way of opening comments, the, the comments by Mr. Thomas and Mr. Fleming answering some of the prior questions addressed what I wanted to talk about, and that was, I thought this report might come up with a, a magic bullet in how we could actually deal with this emerging issue, and and it's far from that case, obviously. So, so let's put that to bed. Look, I, Look at it from a, I look at it from a business perspective. We heard uh, Mr. Krim just recently tell us that hotel assessed values have dropped by 55% in Fort Saskatchewan. I don't know what the average hotel would be valued at to start with, but if in fact it's $10 million, that doesn't seem to be a large number. Multiply by 13 hotels. Um, We've lost $71, $71 million in assessed value. Gordon, you're giving me a dirty look. What's on your mind? Yes, you. Excuse me. I was just I trying to ponder um, on that particular question, Councillor Kelly. I was just going, hmm, I was doing the math. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harris. We'll go back to Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Um, I think our mill rate is nine points on commercial property. So am I right that we're losing somewhere around $650,000 per annum in, in tax revenue on, on our hotel industry? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I, I wouldn't be in a position to, to answer that. That is something um, probably our finance department would need to give some some insight on. Fleming, is that readily available information? Um, through you, Madam Chair, we can take that away and and actually get a full response on it. the The math you're doing there seems to seems to make sense to me, but Mr. Dance, I don't know if you've got a better response than that. Uh, I don't. It, the mill rate, Councillor Kelly, is yeah. It is around nine point uh, seven for for non residential. So I didn't follow your your logic to get to six fifty, but um, that's the mill rate. Well, I don't know how much effort the city should put in this. Uh, I, I truly don't. And but if in fact we're losing, if we've got dead capital on the books, loosely on the books. That that is affecting our potential revenue stream by as much as six hundred and fifty thousand dollars per annum. It might make some sense to to actually get on this project and and get a budget in place to address it. And and that's the point I'd like to leave with administration. So if you could confirm the numbers, John, maybe we could follow up with a little more conversation in council at a later date. For now, then, Councillor Kelly. Yeah. Sorry, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Councillor Abitoui. Yes, um, just wondering, is the federal government, um, is there any incentive programs for um, stuff like this, for maybe hotels to be able to uh, provide um, a residential um, uses for their hotels? Through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Councillor Abitoui. Uh, there is funds available like uh, we've talked to some of the hotel owners and they have been in contact with the province about available funds if they were to um, redevelop their hotel for um, residential purposes particularly like assisted living facilities so i'm not sure about the specifics of the funding and how it works but i know there's some funding available for for hotels yeah, so I'm just wondering, is it like if, would there be would there be funding then available for us as a municipality if this is something one that we want to pursue, or is just directly to the hotel owners? I'm not sure if there if there's any funding available for municipalities for this type of project, but I know there's some funding available for the 
individual hotel owners if they want to apply to redevelop their hotel site. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I agree with the, the comments made by Troy. Um, I think that this is something that should be dealt with on the case by case basis and let um, whoever is interested in, you know, pursuing it um, apply for the um, required permits. Thank you. Councilor Harris. Not too many years ago, um, the city did a review um, of whether it needed more hotel space. And it was before all of the massive growth and the number of hotel properties that we've got. And the study at that time stated we had more than enough hotel space in Fort Saskatchewan. So the market reacted to it the way the market did. And the people that built the hotels overbuilt in this market. So that's why we have more per capita than uh, your report identified. So uh, I'm not surprised and it's unfortunate if we can find a solution. Uh, my only concern is, is if we convert these um, hotel properties to residential uses, then are we going to be flip-flopping back and forth between uses um, and then ultimately then not being able to use them for their intended purpose, which is short stay um, land use. Um, so. You know, we, we've got to be very careful how we go down this road, but uh, the city did know we were overbuilt in the hotel. The market did at the market, so it is where it is. So that's unfortunate, but it is. Okay, looks like you're good. Uh, Councillor Sperling? No questions, thank you. Okay. I Someone said they had a second round. Put up your hand if you need a second round. Not seeing any. Thank you, Mr. Siddons. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, for being here tonight. Uh, we've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes. Does anyone need a comfort break? Looking for hands. Yes, I see one. Eight, two. So it's uh, 617. So let's just go around numbers. We'll come back at 625. Turn off your video and your mics.
if we can get everyone to start turning on their videos, the time is 625. Councillor Kelly, Mayor Ketcher, who else are we missing? Councillor Sperling. Just cleaning my her? face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's some. It's not showing me everybody now. Um, Berlin, Councillor Harris and Councillor Abtoy, can you just confirm that you are on? I'm here. Do you I not see me? I, it just might be something happening with my computer. I only it only came back as a four person grid. So um, sounds like everyone is here. That's great. Uh, we'll move on to our next presentation, which is Truth and Reconciliation, and I'll invite uh, Diane Yatch to present. Good evening, Madam Chair, Mayor, and Council. With me this evening are Jessica Weller, the Program Coordinator at the Fort Heritage Precinct, and Josh Jennings, the Shell Theatre Supervisor. We are here tonight to talk about truth and re reconciliation and building cultural awareness and relationships with Indigenous peoples. At the December 12, 2019 regular Council meeting, a notice of motion R27719 was passed. The motion reads that administration bring back information regarding the truth and reconciliation reconciliation process that includes an overview of and truth and reconciliation, an outline of the calls to action for all levels of government and specifically identified for municipalities as identified by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. An outline of the articles that impact the municipality as identified in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of the World, and an implementation plan, including financial impacts for the city to follow through on our primary responsibilities under truth and reconciliation. Good evening, everyone. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established in 2008. Its mandate was to inform all Canadians about Indian residential schools and what happened in them by documenting the truth of survivors, families, and communities impacted. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada believes reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people is a process of healing relationships which requires public truth sharing, apology, and commemoration that acknowledges and redresses past harms. This reconciliation requires joint leadership, trust building, accountability, and transparency. In 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its findings and 94 calls to action, outlining steps forward in the reconciliation process. These calls to action cover a wide range of government areas of responsibilities, which includes education, social services, language and culture, health, justice, museums and archives, and training for public servants. Of the 94 calls to action, there are eight recommendations that are addressed to all levels of government and five recommendations that specifically refer to municipal governments. We have outlined these 13 recommendations and how the city of Fort Saskatchewan can respond to them in Appendix A. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is, is an international instrument adopted by the United Nations on September 13, 2007 to enshrine the rights that constitute the minimum standards for the survival, dignity and well-being of the Indigenous people of the world. Canada did not remove its objector status of this um, declaration until May 2016. The declaration is intended to maintain worldwide relevancy. This declaration outlines a number of principles that should underscore and support all decisions regarding Indigenous peoples' rights. 
it is recommended that this declaration is consulted in full rather than isolating individual articles and providing specific recommendations for each one. There are five articles highlighted in Appendix B that are especially relevant to the City of Fort Saskatchewan and the work to be carried out in the next five years. The articles address issues around the use and care of ceremonial and traditional objects, the sharing of Indigenous culture, language, traditional knowledge, connection to the land, and oral history, and the right to develop, teach, and practice their spiritual beliefs, traditional games, and sharing of intellectual and cultural properties. The federal government brought forward legislation on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in December 2020. If it is passed by Parliament, this legislation will provide a roadmap for the government and Indigenous peoples to work together fully to implement the Declaration. Once developed, this federal action plan will help guide the City of Fort Saskatchewan in our application of this Declaration as a framework for reconciliation. We brought forward three options of moving forward towards reconciliation. Option one uses existing staff and focuses on traditional knowledge gathering, land recognition, cultural awareness, and education. We'll begin by building relationships with local Indigenous communities and continue to collaborate with our neighbouring municipalities. Developing land recognition guidelines when they're required, when they're optional, and why they're used. Continue to showcase Indigenous culture in programs and events. Offer training for council and senior leadership, such as a blanket exercise. Offer staff training through existing recognized programs targeting 30% of staff each year. And sharing free or low cost educational tools with interested staff and departments. Option two uses existing staff with a focus on traditional knowledge gathering, land recognition, cultural awareness, and the development of our own online education program and completing an oral history specific to the city of Fort Saskatchewan. This option includes um, all the elements one through five of option one, the development of treaty six and region specific training program with the help of indigenous consultants. Conduct an oral history study of the Fort Saskatchewan area and commission a public art piece that celebrates additional indigenous culture and history. Option three uses external resources as the lead for truth and reconciliation versus um, in existing resources. This focuses on traditional knowledge gathering, land recognition, cultural awareness, um, our own education program, the oral history, and also expanding the story at the Fort Heritage Precinct to tell local Indigenous history. Option three includes all the items in option two, except the lead for the truth and reconciliation as an external contractor. An addition to this option is to bring in a consultant to review the Fort Heritage Precinct content to enable the expansion of the Fort Heritage Precinct story. Option one is $5,000 in year one, 30,000 in year two, and a total of 55,000 for years three through five. Option two is $35,000 for year one, 81,000 total for years two and three, and 139,000 total for years four through seven. Option three is $85,000 for year one, 141,000 for year two, and a total of 183,000 for years three through five. Reserves can be used for the public art piece and changes to the Fort Heritage Precinct story. Steps forward, um, refer the Truth and Reconciliation Report and Action Plan to a regular council meeting for a decision, or refer the Truth and Reconciliation Report and Action Plan to the 2020 budget. As we move forward with truth and reconciliation, we recognize the need to include the voices of Indigenous peoples and create connections between the city and Indigenous community members. We expect that this work will be fluid in nature, which means that our plans and timelines will need to remain flexible as we continue to learn about our role in this process. It's also very important to recognize that the process of truth and reconciliation is a long-term commitment. And although we expect the first five years of this work will require increased attention as we establish a base of knowledge and begin building those relationships with Indigenous communities, 
We know that truth and reconciliation will continue to be an integral component of the culture and recreation department on a long-term ongoing basis. Thank you for allowing us to share our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your presentation. I will start with Councillor Lennox. Thank you ladies for the presentation and I do appreciate the amount of work that I uh, put into this report. Um, I brought this forward, I think it was in December of 2019. Um, my time on the RCMP um, brought me to different communities within uh, Western Canada. And some of those experiences are obviously unique to that profession um, and left me with a certain perspective. And I come to the city of Fort Saskatchewan, um, who, which embraces very much a culture from the Northwest Mounted Police and the RCMP. Um, and I didn't completely understand how you couldn't have that culture and the Indigenous community kind of intertwined because from my perspective, they very much are. And so I guess that is where it kind of came from and the vision that I had. And it, instead of getting specific, I just kind of want to put a general question out to you first. What I just get trying to get an understanding of what your vision is of this and what you feel from your perspective, what you're trying to accomplish in this. Through Madam Chair, I think our biggest thing is um, the focus needs to be on building those relationships and expanding the story that we tell. Um, currently, we tell a very colonial history and we need to be able to expand that story to include everybody else's stories that were here at the same time and all of the stories we need to tell moving forward. And I, I agree. I think the relationship building is a key. And I do think that as a result of that relationship building piece that perhaps a path might kind of become um, visible. Uh, and so, and I think that there's other, you know, the historical society, for instance, is, is uh, will be a good uh, connection as well. But I'm not sure that we're at a place where I feel comfortable throwing a bunch of money at this when I don't know that we really understand what the needs are yet. Um, but those are just my thoughts and I'm really interested to see or to hear what other thoughts from council is. But thank you again. Councilor Lennox, I am up. Um, I don't really have any questions, uh, anything that had kind of come up, you you talked about already. Um, I thought it was a really well done report. I wasn't sure what to expect. And um, it was, there's a lot of information and it was really interesting. And um, I think a lot of the, uh, things that they are asking levels of government to do um, take a lot of time, as you said, and will take funding. So um, I look forward to the discussion actually on how we as a city are going to move forward and which option that we choose. I did participate in a blanket ceremony that I believe the Multicultural Society put on, um, and it was definitely eye-opening and really interesting. And I look forward to uh, talking more about this with council on which option we choose moving forward. Apologies, Councillor uh, Kelly. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the report. Uh, extremely comprehensive. I also did not know what to expect. Um, we're fortunate enough in our family to have a family member that's a, a status Indigenous person. So I brought her and her husband over last night and we, we went through this as a family and discussed it at length. I can I can share their comments with you and I and I believe that I I will also tell you that I agree with their comments. 
they didn't personally see a lot of long term value in the education program because staff turnover and council turnover. Uh, unless we're prepared to spend a, a significant amount of money on an annual basis and every year that would soon get lost. And I'm not sure. They're not sure how the education alone helps build and join the communities. Not that education is bad. They just couldn't see the connection, the direct connection. They very much did like the, the suggestion of an art piece. Uh, so we talked about that and they questioned the budget. They're aware also that the, the city budgets $100,000 per year for art and community places. And they, they asked me if in fact we had in the past allocated any of that budget toward indigenous art and I, and I said, I didn't know, but I would ask. So please consider that my first question. Uh, through Madam Chair, we have not done um, an Indigenous art piece um, in the past. We did in the art in public places piece, which we um, is a smaller project where we purchase a piece of art from a local artist. This past year, we did one from an artist with an Ojibwe background, um, and it will be on display at the Shell Theater once we are able to reopen. But for the larger pieces that we've done, we have not done a um, an Indigenous piece um, yet. Um, and to the education piece, what we're looking at in option two and three is to develop our own online program. That way we have it to share with staff for a very long time versus bringing in or using existing programming that you would have to pay for continually as staff turnover. Um, so that is why we were looking at an online program that we would develop in consultation with local indigenous communities. Then we're telling their story. And you, you just mentioned it, you touched on my next question. You led me right to it. Um, in the preparation of the report, did you conduct, consult with any of the Indigenous community? The report that we have in front of us now? Uh, through Madam Chair, uh, when we first started the process back in 2019, we did. We had a, an Indigenous community group that we were working with. Unfortunately, that group has now folded. Um, so in the future, we will uh, just move forward on any of this need to reach out to those indigenous communities. Okay, thank you. And I guess I question the budget numbers. Uh, it would seem to me that that indigenous art could be part of our annual review of 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 our art purchases through our normal budget allocation of $100,000 per year. And I don't know why we would need to allocate on a one-time basis only a special $100,000. And, and, and that would be my opinion going forward, that we, we take a look at the art part of it and, and make it part of our ongoing, ongoing routine. I particularly like the suggestion of revisiting the Fort Heritage, Heritage site and, and, and updating, bringing forward, broadening our depth there. I think that's, I think that's critical and, and would be viewed by the entire community over the years and have a very broad impact. So those two initiatives I can support wholeheartedly. I, um, just wonder about the cost for the rest of it. And I can, I'm done for right now. Thank you, Chair, Madam Chair. Brian, do you have comments on the budget? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, through Madam Chair, uh, just a quick clarification on the art in public places or the public art piece. Um, I believe right now we're only transferring $20,000 per year into the reserve. And then I would, um, in that year we do the piece, we would come to council and ask for that money from the reserve to be spent on that piece. Um, and we're suggesting $100,000 for that piece. I believe in the reserve, there's about 140,000, 160,000 currently. Okay, thank you, Diana. I stand to be corrected. Uh, Mr. Dance or Mr. Fleming, is it 100,000 per year into reserve or is it just 20? I don't know where I got the 100 from, but I'm sure I've seen it in the past. Um, through your through you, Madam Chair, if uh, Mr. Dance has the number, the transfer number, that would be great. But I, I do know, I believe it used to be a hundred, or used to be up around that level, and we've reduced it 
at least once, if not twice in the last three or four years, twice. Yeah. So it's, it's, it, you might be remembering the older number, but it's been reduced a couple times um, along the way. The transfer, the amount we put in. What is the amount currently? I'm, if you could just bear with me, if you could continue, I'll just go into the budget and within a minute or two, I'll have the answer for you. I appreciate that. Uh, Madam Chair, um, please. Thanks, Mr. Dance. I'll move on to Councillor Abatoy and. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so just as a out of curiosity, do we have an estimated number of indigenous people in our community? Through Madam Chair, I believe in the report it's um, just under a thousand people or six percent of our population. But it's in the report. I would have to double check the numbers. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, just my like, I don't. I really don't have any questions. I think the report was very, very well done and um, proper, well thought through, and um, the action plan I think is a solid one. Um, but I think that this is something that should come to budgets because we're asking for money for um, um, for the program. Um, I think it's something that council should deliberate at budget time. Um, and that, that's just that's, that's just my comments on it. But very well done. The report's very well done. Thank you. If, Thank you, I, uh, Mr. Dance. If I could interject, uh, I actually, uh, it was correct. The Art in Public Places is a twenty thousand dollar contribution in the two thousand and twenty one budget, and there is, as as Diane had indicated, one hundred and forty three thousand dollars in the reserve. Thank you. I'll move on to uh, Mr. or Councilor Harris. Yes, thanks. So, respecting that each community um, has its own unique connection with the Aboriginal or with First Nations uh, peoples and cultures and history and whatnot, um, have we had any conversations with any of the other communities, like the City of Saint Albert, for example? Um, in terms of how they've approached truth and reconciliation and the acknowledgement, because they obviously do have uh, kind of an indigenous past, um, obviously in certain ways. But have we looked at uh, kind of what's what's happening uh, almost as a best practice um, in terms of how we can best connect with this particular uh, topic area and make wise choices so that we can actually engage properly? Um, Cultural awareness and relationship building is important, but it's kind of a, I'm not sure if it really fills it in too much for me, just bringing art into the, uh, into the equation. Um, and I ask that question because I know that several of uh, our council colleagues in the city of St. Albert uh, seem to be quite plugged into this whole truth and reconciliation. So my question is, have we looked at what the city of St. Albert is doing, for example, or, they doing anything that is unique and uh, is creating a better connection uh, with this topic. Uh, through Madam Chair, uh, Jessica is actually part of a regional uh, group um, of municipalities that the whole focus is on truth and reconciliation, um, okay. and they gather on a quarterly basis um, to discuss what everybody's doing, what they're learning, um, what's working, what's not. Um, so they have that opportunity. Um, St. Albert, I believe, is a part of that. Um, one of the reasons why they are much further ahead is that they had a residential school. Um, so they are more directly impacted um, than we are. But Jessica might be able to provide additional information on that group. Um, yes, I can uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have specific information on St. Albert, but I can tell you about a, a couple of other comparable municipalities in our region. Um, so uh, many of them are at similar points as we are in terms of developing um, frameworks for engagement with Indigenous communities. Um, so, for example, Strathcona County is developing a policy currently on Indigenous engagement, um, and Devon has also developed an Indigenous engagement framework, as well as moved forward with um, staff education. And then we do see in some larger municipalities, such as um, Edmonton, as well as the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, um, that they have also moved forward with staff education um, as well. Um, so those uh, some, some more information is available online for the Fort McMurray region. Um, so within the con Broader context, um, are you suggesting that the recommendations or the observations made in the report are the best way to move forward, 
Um, obviously, we can't accomplish everything in a short period of time. But is this, in your qualified opinion, the best way to at least start the process? Uh, through Madam Chair, I think the biggest piece will be education. Um, there's a lot of people in our community that don't have a basis of knowledge. Um, we was never taught in schools, never taught correctly in schools. Um, I think there's that's one of the major pieces that we need to, going forward is just to bring basic awareness of the Indigenous community and the issues that they face about residential schools, about intergenerational trauma and how that impacts um, people today, I think is one of the key pieces. I think the other key piece is oral history. Um, the Indigenous communities don't have a written history. So being able to do an oral history is is very important for us to be able to expand the story at the Fort Heritage Precinct. So I'm taking it that this is an appropriate frame of reference or scope of reference to start the start the process. And uh, I, I guess I would tend to agree with Councillor Avatoye. Um, anything that's going to see quite a, potentially a large expenditure of resources really should be considered in, in a holistic context. And that's not to take anything away from the importance of this, uh, but obviously to consider everything in context. So that I would support that particular observation going forward. You look uh, like you finished, Councillor Harris. I'll move on to Councillor Sperling. Thank you for the presentation, Diane and Jessica. Just a quick question up front. It indicates in the uh, in uh, the package that the federal government's legislation has been moved forward. And is there any idea of when that that uh, will be passed by Parliament? Through Madam Chair, I don't have uh, that information currently. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, I just thought maybe it was due to come up on a certain docket or something. That's fine. Um, appreciate the comments so far on this. Um, essentially, I've got no hesitations in in supporting the calls to action outcomes that we we may move to. And like a couple of the other counselors before me, I do believe uh, this is the budget item for 2022. Uh, and we can provide consideration there in terms of funding. Thank you. Uh, great, Mayor Ketra, you are next. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I'd like to say first is uh, the truth and reconciliation part of this is a little bit newer to Fort Saskatchewan, but as far as the history of our Métis and our First Nations folks, uh, citizens that were here before us and uh, are currently living here, um, when the 2014 Heritage um, Historic Precinct Site Master Plan was created, and it had a lot of public engagement in it, and it talked about the fact that we needed to bring awareness uh, of our Métis Nation and our First Nations. So within the context of the document, and uh, so of course we we um, did the, the fort and we've done upgrades to it, but we never have put money towards the next steps. And within that document, it talks about the Métis node. And it also talks about the First Nations node and staging area. And I think that that's something that's really relevant that was missed within this report. And I know the report is talking specifically about truth and reconciliation, but I think the fact is we have been talking about this for several years now, but we haven't made any steps forward. And, you know, when we talk about um, an art piece or something, I think there's an opportunity maybe to revive the, the um, the nodes and the staging areas and take a look at those and see what we could do with those because it talks about some colorful highlights, a teepee village in the summer, cultural activities and work areas, skinning or fishing areas, 
collections of stone and bone tools, clothing and traditional outfits, horse, horse and uh, corral. And within that document, it says the planned vision for the node is to inspire people to discover, revive, protect, and demonstrate our First Nations past and present cultures through visitor experiences and firsthand programs. But what I have learned uh, over the number of years as being the mayor of Fort Saskatchewan, a lot of people um, may or may not be interested in history, but it's something that is very important to our community, very important to our historical society that has been working on advancing what's going on in our historic uh, area. So I think these are some areas that really need to be revived. You know, we talk about you know, are we going to do something? Well, you know what I say, we got to kind of put our money where our mouth is at. Um, it was last term, and I'll say it was my son who brought an Indigenous, uh, very uh, famous Indigenous person to City Council, and he asked um, City Council if they would support using the um, old fort to bring in elders to talk about truth and reconciliation and council said yeah you can we'll we'll waive the fee for it but you have to raise all the funding to to deal with this so once again it didn't succeed because um i'll be honest it's it's difficult to raise funding for different things but it still comes down to the point we've been talking about this for years but unless we actually start putting some money towards it Nothing's going to ever happen. And I think it's really sad that, you know, we had an organization. We had Large Johnson, who just lives over on, uh, on uh, 99th Avenue, and she brought a group to Fort Saskatchewan. She was trying to make this group happen, and she asked for funding. And once again, there was no funding available. She was able to hold a small powwow in Legacy Park, but once again, without funding, nothing can happen. So I very much believe that if we want to do something, we need to act as a council to do this. I fully support the fact that it is time to show that we do support our Indigenous community. And I think at that point in time, I thought she said there was about 1,400 living in the fort, you know. So um, I'm just of the opinion, I'll support whatever option will get something moving, but now is the time. So um, I just say, it's been on our books. It's time to dust it off and just start doing something. And uh, Ms. Yanch, I know you're familiar with, with the plan. And I, I would hope that maybe, you know, through these conversations, something will get revived from there. So those are just my comments and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Weller, can I just get you to turn off your video for one second so I can see all of council on my screen? Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to show of hands if anyone needs a round two. A couple people. Uh, so I will start with Councillor Lennox. Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, Diane in that I think the education piece um, is important. I know I've taken um, the Indigenous awareness train, um, and I was uh, shocked, honestly, at what I didn't know. Um, and so I, I strongly encourage uh, other members of council to, to take um, that kind of training. I think the U of A is offering um, some as well. So I don't know, Diana, are you able to provide any information about that? Through Madam Chair, um, I know both Jessica and I have taken that program through the U of A. It is a 12, they say 12 week program. It's free of charge um, to do um, and we can provide that link to anybody who's interested. Thank you. Um, so I guess where I get um, kind of hung up is I think government a lot of times does things for the sake of doing things and does things to people as opposed to for people. Um, and I don't know how we can, I mean, the report indicates that there's 1400 um, people from Indigenous or Métis community within Fort Saskatchewan. And, and how do we, you know, 
have we worked together to move this forward? Because I don't think that it should be something simply that we put forward. And I really would like it to be a collaborative effort um, and have us all invested in this and not just um, us wanting to move this forward in a, in a way that feels great for us. So um, I guess uh, what is the strategy then as far as building those relationships? Um, through Madam Chair, Jessica may be able to add some additional information, but the biggest thing is, is that relationship building. It's, it's the part that takes the most amount of time, but it is the most essential part in, in moving forward with truth and reconciliation. Um, it's building relationships. It's um, one of the things city of Edmonton did, did was they would hold a workshop and invite the indigenous community. And it's a simple conversation. Um, that's how things start. That's how we learn how um, the Indigenous communities want to be represented and what they need going forward. So there's some things in community building and relationship building that need to go as step one. Through you, Madam Chair, um, I can add to that a little bit as well. Um, I think that no matter what option we move forward with, we would like to see consultation being um, a main part of our strategy. So rather than us making decisions about what needs to happen in these areas, we would seek out um, the input of the Indigenous individuals and communities that are in the area. Yeah, and I, I do like, you know, just from the training that I took, there's obviously a huge um, air of mistrust, if I can go that far between government and, and the Indigenous community. And I do think that it is going to take a tremendous amount of time and effort um to kind of work our way through that because and i want to invest that time and work our way through that because that is when it's going to become meaningful and that is when it's going to be meaningful for everyone um so it, i just really encourage that that piece um take a lot of time and consideration so and i do actually agree with my fellow counselors in that um, I do think it needs to be put forward uh, at the budget um, for any additional uh, funding and requests. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lennox. Um, I don't have any further questions. So I'll move on to Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. I perhaps didn't completely understand the comment that was made about the education system, but that, that subject came up last night. Um, both of the people that were in our house were in are in their mid to early twenties, and they both stressed that the education system, for their time in school, did a pretty decent job of 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 covering some of the issues and and certainly the history. Um, the Fort High website, for instance, speaks highly of a Mr. Uh, I wrote his name down, Elder Wilson Bearcloth, or pardon me, Elder Wilson Bearhead. Um, well-respected individual who's been active over the years in, in their high school. Uh, I'd just suggest then that if in, in this, I guess in the, in the collaborative mode that we would include the education system as part of the team approach to, to looking at, at, at what we could be doing, because um, they, they're already doing something in that area, certainly not for the time I went to school, but I'm pleased to acknowledge that, in fact, it has changed for the for the more recent generations. Uh, I would support Mayor Catcher's comments, and I alluded that to them earlier. I was just unaware of the history. Uh, the Fort Heritage site is the site that, if properly designed, would give the best education for the citizens at large. And that's what we're after, I think, is, is not trying to educate two or 300 people at city, city, city Hall, but educate everybody. And, and it's that type of approach, I think, that would have the most effect. And it goes without saying, it is a, I support the, the comments from my fellow councillors, that it is a budget question and perhaps give it a little more thought and tune it up and uh, yeah, bring it back for the budget this fall. I think you'll get a, um, a positive response from council. And thank you for the report again. Councillor Kelly, Councillor Abtoy. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so once again, I obviously support this, um, and I'm I'm sure based on all the comments that have been made so far, um, I believe that all of council supports this. Um, even though we're all saying that we're bringing back during budgets, I'm just wondering, are there things we can do right now? You know, that doesn't exactly require resources. And something that comes readily to mind is, um, is like acknowledgement of the land, for example. Is that something we can do right away? As, are there things we can do right away that we can just, you know, get the wheels moving already on this? Um, Madam Chair, maybe I'll I'll take a first stab at this one if that's okay, because um, I've been listening intently here, and um, the whole next steps piece is obviously uh, um, important here. And and what we've sort of been listening for within the feedback itself is trying to get the understanding from council if they like I'd say administration's position here at a high level is that uh, there needs to be action. Something this needs to become a part of our. Our work plan, but I've also heard council say, you know, in terms of uh, the dollars and to what level um, that would be a budget question. But it's also been mentioned that the relationship building piece and to get some inclusion at the start is important uh, before we actually decide and finalize our, our strategy. So, if I think if it would be if there would be no objection amongst council, maybe what I could suggest is that. If you look in the report and the budget it, in in the the first option and it had a first I think it was kind of a five thousand dollar relationship building item. Maybe what I could suggest is that that dollar amount um, and if there's no objection from from council that we would actually move forward with some outreach work um, that could happen this year and to try to do an initial bit of consultation and touching base um, just within our our the resources that we have within the budget now. And then, so I think we would agree that the work can can start in earnest that way, but that anything that would move forward in terms of bigger budget asks that those would become a budget matter for 2022 or and, and beyond. And uh, that's probably what I would suggest. And and then um, if if uh, Ms. Yanch wants to um, maybe add into that or supplement those comments, um, that would be good. Uh, through Madam Chair, uh, we do have, uh, I know Jessica has been working on land recognition um, guidelines already. Um, so that could be brought forward for information on when, when, how um, those are done. Um, the biggest thing with land recognition is it needs to come from the heart and be and not be scripted. Um, so in the beginning, it is scripted. It, we provide very detailed information on how to do a land recognition, but eventually, um, the script goes away and land recognition comes from the heart and that's what's most important. Um, but we can start to work on providing that information. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate your comments, um, um, Troy and Diane, and I can definitely get behind um, um, what you just talked about, Troy. Thank you. Thanks, I'll go to Councillor Harris. I have no further questions, thanks. Councillor Sperling? No questions. Good discussion. Sure. No, I think I'm good. I think I brought up all the points that I had, just hoping to see something going forward. And, and uh, if we're not going to put any money to it now, just see if there is something that we can do that is symbolic. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I just uh, hand wave if you want a third round? Okay, seeing one councillor Lennox. Do you have anything further? You're good. I just if I could just follow up. I sure. I think um I think what the government has done over the last many decades has all been very much symbolic. And so I would hope and appreciate that any work going forward would be um, meaningful in some way. So thank you. Um, I appreciate Mr. Fleming, your comments about um, how we can move forward in the future. Um, I agree with spending that money to so start those relationships and getting that feedback. Um, I'm just wondering if you felt, or perhaps Diane, you can answer this, um, if it was appropriate to include council in those conversations, could we be part of a working group if that's what it was? Uh, 
Um, through Madam Chair, I think we need to start with um, finding out who all is interested, both on the Indigenous community side and also on Council. Um, I'm not sure if Ms. Cowie has anything to add. Um, again, with uh, through Madam Chair, with uh, Mr. Fleming, I think I've been listening with intent as well, and it's been a, a delightful conversation. And I think the the um, the pillars, if you will, of this is about honoring, respect, dignity, and inclusion. And that's moving forward. And, and how do we do that in a way that is safe, um, mutually respectful, and at not at our pace, um, but at the pace of our, our new partners who we're, we're going to work with. So I think if there's, I know, I, I think I can speak as well. I've also taken the course from the U of A and it is incredibly powerful. And any kind of learning that we can do sets us up to speak more from the heart, as Diane has talked about when we do the land recognition. So I think as we move forward, we wanna make sure that we're educating and we're rising all at the same time. Um, and I don't know if that's a working committee or if that's learning and working together. So I, I'll maybe I'll, I'll reserve judgment on that before we move forward. But I appreciate everybody's comments and it's been really great. Thank you. And as I'm reading this uh, plan that was, I just, I feel like I wish I could hear and learn about it as the process unfolds and not just in these moments where we compile information. And I think getting that education right from them and hearing right from them um, is part of, of buying in for, for me. So, um, so I would be interested in that if 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 that were an option. So um, I'll move on, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. I just wanted to offer my support of of Troy's suggestion. Um, I think it makes sense to to lay a little bit of groundwork now. And it, I don't, but I was uncertain, Troy. Were you suggesting that the five thousand could be found within the budget as it sits, or were you suggesting that we needed an amendment to the budget? Uh, no, through you, Madam Chair, what I was saying is we'll we'll endeavor to find the five thousand dollars and just work and to begin that work now. Um, I, I think the biggest thing, even going forward, is just identifying the who and who are we talking to and those stakeholders, and maybe having some initial outreach. Um, so the the cost to just get that initial kind of outreach going, I would describe as being minimal, and uh, and we'll and then that will help us build a more sophisticated plan. That uh, we could look at for the 2022 budget. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. Great recommendation. Councillor Abitwe. I'm good. I already made my last list of comments. Thank you. Councillor Harris, I can't see you. So if you could verbally tell me if you're good or not. Uh, no further questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sperling, are you good? Yeah, counts or Mayor Ketcher, you're good still. Yeah, all right, awesome. So uh, thank you, Miss Weller and Miss Yanch, and I know Mr. Jennings is in there somewhere on the screen. So thank you all for being here uh, tonight. We really appreciate the presentation. Up next, we have Renee Fitzsimmons and John Dance speaking to Council Remuneration and Expenses Policy and Procedure Review. Uh. Thank you, uh, Chair, and I'll introduce this briefly. I, my name is John Dance. I'm the General Manager of Corporate Services, and the purpose of this item is to get uh, Committee of the Whole's feedback on the current Council remuneration and expense policy and procedure. Council has had the opportunity to work with this policy and procedure for the last three and a half years, and this is an opportunity now to provide feedback as part of the review process. The current policy was adopted in July of 2017, so just at the tail end of the uh, of the previous council. So the policy and procedure address base remuneration activities and review processes per diem amounts and eligibility, professional development, eligible expenses, promotional budgets, transportation, accommodations, meals, equipment, and benefits. So the meeting package also includes uh, research on per diems criteria uh, from across the region. I guess there was about, I believe there's about 10, 10 different municipalities in, in Appendix A that have a, a variety of way of, of dealing with per diems. 
And next steps is uh, based on any feedback from Committee of the Whole. Um, administration would return to a future council meeting with any proposed updates to the policy and procedure for council consideration. If there were no changes to consider, the policy would consider to be reviewed and we would schedule the next review date in the, in the appropriate cycle, which would likely be uh, into 2025, into T1 of 2025. Um, Ms. Fitzsimmons and Ms. Moulter and myself are all available for to receive the feedback and to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Dance. I'll start with Councillor Kelly. You caught me by surprise, Madam Chair. Um, but I am ready. Thank you. I'd like to start with reference to Gov009C, the remuneration and expenses, there's a statement made in point four, the mayor shall be considered a full-time position and councils, councillors shall be considered a part-time. Uh, I wonder if you could offer a definition of both of those and what what they mean to administration? Is that being is that a fair question, John? <laughs> I not particularly from my perspective. It isn't a fair question, and certainly, you know, it, it never ceases to me. Uh, prepare for and expect for questions, and then the first one out of the gate. So, um, so Troy wants to take a shot at that. Um, well, let me add some background. Um, I'm not sure what full-time and part-time mean either. Uh, but as I read through this, it occurred to me that it might make sense, and I'm just gonna throw this on the table and, and I'm not really looking for a debate on it. I'll let it, everybody take it for what it's worth. It, it might make sense to have a package for new counselors that explains in, in some level of detail, what the expectations of a counselor are. Because I'm not sure that the term part time or full time adequately address the actual expectations, certainly when I look at my calendar this week. So I'll leave it at that for now um, and move on. I'm looking at um, the procedure and bullet point six of promotional budget. Both the mayor's position and individual counselors have a, a promotional budget. Is it a requirement that expenditures from that promotional budget be itemized? Just like, for instance, a, a meal expense is where you have to indicate who the recipient is for the expenditure? Maybe I'll defer to Brenda on that one, if, if that's all right to Ms. Moulter, if, if that is in fact posted with the rest of council expenses. Um. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor to Councillor Kelly. Um, I would need to confirm that 100%, but I believe things are itemized uh, when they are on the website, yes. When I, well, let me, let me make, make myself clear. There's a difference between itemized and documented. So let me change the terminology a little bit. In the policy, it says if there's a meal expenditure, the, poly, the, the receipt must indicate who shared in the meal. So if there's a promotional item, um, for instance, a gift voucher, is it a requirement to, to explain who the recipient of the voucher was? Um, I believe that we do keep that information. We track it when that, that expense is made. Uh, perhaps Ms. Exley may be able to provide further clarification because she is involved in the uh, posting of the, the expenses. But I do know that we we do capture that information when the information when the expense is made. I'm not sure I've seen it on the website though. Could I ask you to get back to council on that with a little more detail, please? Definitely. Thank you. Um, I have other questions, but I'm disorganized. So, Madam Chair, please come back. Thank you. No problem, uh, Councillor Abatoye. Yes, yeah, so um, 
this um, bylaw policy, whatever it is, um, is usually reviewed every four years. So, okay, so well, well I guess I'll say yes. Um, so what is it? Is it usually, um, do we, is it reviewed based on maybe um, the municipal price index or inflation? Like what usually goes into that review? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Abitoya. So there's a number of elements that will go in. So there are two of the elements obviously are um, remuneration as well as per diem to see where they are in comparators to the seven comparators, okay. uh, the CPI index as well. Um, those items are, are fairly straightforward in that they're reviewed against seven comparators and, and um, for a mid-market maximum and then into future years budgets, that would be a consideration. Today is more of a, a wholesale review of the overall policy and procedure. So um, it was due for a review and, and typically with something like this, it's, it's which council works with this policy and procedures very, very closely. It was a good opportunity after, you know, the majority of the term has, has, has gone through to have that opportunity to take a look at it. Okay, thank you, John. Um, well, I think I'm I'm okay with what with it. Um, yeah, I'm okay with this. Um, I think we've got like um, municipal comparators to compare where we sit, and it, it seems like we sit really nicely right in the middle. Uh, I think that's a good place for council to be, and I'm okay with with where we're sitting on right right now. Thank you. Councilor Harris. You know, generally speaking, I find the policy and the procedures to be generally boilerplate um, in terms of looking at what the compensation factor is over a period of time. I'm, I, I don't have a problem with communicate or with the uh, remuneration amount that we're currently getting. The only suggestion that I could make, and I think it came out of something that happened last last council term, um, under the procedure in 3.8 B. I think that needs to be adjusted such that if a counselor chooses to use their per diems to deal with uh, tenants at um, uh, boards, committees, or commissions for which they've been appointed to represent council, that uh, there should be able the ability to uh, use the per diem as they see fit and it not necessarily have to be a meeting six hours in length. Um, because we do in the uh, on the form, we can claim a half half day per diem and a full day per diem, and I think that the policy should respect that, and that uh, each individual uh, counselor is is able to make a judgment call as to how they choose to use the portion of the per diem budgets that have been allocated to them as individual elected officials. So that would be the one suggestion that I would make, and uh, other than that. Uh, Generally, I'm satisfied with the level of remuneration that we get and the support that we get from uh, administration in doing the things that we have to to comply with the policy, ensuring that things are appropriately documented, appropriately signed off and uh, posted uh, transparently, transparently on the website. So I'm, I'm happy with that. that. That's about the only observation I guess I would make. That's all I have to add. Thank you, Councillor Sperling. You know, I, I looked at the uh, remuneration comparators, comparators for the per diem expenses, and um, I think Councillor Abatoy has already pointed it out, but uh, we sit sort of in the middle. If there's a standard among all these, it's the one that we're sitting at. In appreciation of Councillor Harris's comments, I do believe uh, whatever policy has been changed in terms of our half day and full day per diems um i think that needs to be amended to to reflect what uh what the policy was in the past prior to last term and uh other than that i don't have i have no suggestions on decreasing or increasing any other uh comparators or expenses thanks Thank you, Mayor Ketcher. Okay, thank you. So for the most part, I think we did a good job on the council remuneration policy last time. I do agree with uh, Councillor Harris, so because of COVID um, and the fact that a lot of meetings are, try uh, everyone's trying to keep them between two and three hours uh, and there's no driving involved that uh, 
I believe there's probably very few per diems that are actually being issued uh, out of the per diem account. So there should be some uh, allotment or or uh, ability, you know, to to trust the council when they are doing something. Um, if they're not getting a per diem somewhere else. Uh, other than that, I think the uh, policy um, is good. And, uh, you know, if there's any other adjustment other than adjusting maybe one item in the policy, uh, any of the compensation or any of that uh, would come forward as part of the, the um, budget process. Uh, if there was anything and the council of the day would uh, make a decision if, uh, because that would happen uh, each year, depending on what the comparables are, every how many years that they're talking about uh, doing the analysis. And I'm just going to confirm that. Um, this, I don't know if I'm asking you, Mr. Dance. Sure. So, in terms of the comparators, Mayor Catcher, it was every four years. Okay. So, then basically, uh, the way the policy is written, then something would be presented to the new council. And then they would decide if we are within the uh, mid market range, and then they would make a decision, correct? That is correct. And, but they're not required to increase it or decrease it. That's they are not. their choice. Yeah, it's okay. a decision in the proposed budget. Great. Thank you. Councillor Lennox. Thank you. So, what accountability is there for members of council who receive remuneration from their committees? Um, and don't report that remuneration and I'll just, I'll leave it there until you answer Mr. Benz. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll answer initially and then I'll, I'll just check with uh, Ms. Moulter and Ms. Exley in terms of what's reported. Um, when council does the appointments, so when it, in the public meeting, when council appointments are made to boards and committees, it is identified which uh, which committees and boards do have remuneration attached to them specifically. And I'll just uh, just double check with Ms. Moulter and Ms. Exley of what what might be reported on the website. I have just asked uh, Ms. Exley to respond, so she will take care of this one. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, through your worship. Um, uh, with respect to members of council uh, bringing forward expenses that they do claim with other boards and committees or do receive a, a kind of compensation for sitting on those committees, a copy of a pay stub or a check is provided to me, and that is posted via the website with your monthly expenses. But there is no accountability if, if members of council don't provide those and then they just don't appear on the website. Correct. It is the responsibility of the council member to provide that information to Jennifer and then it comes to me. So then who then is accountable um, because we're talking about giving council kind of a little bit more rain as far as um, claiming per diems and then so it would just totally be on on the members of council for any sense of accountability. Is that, is that correct? Um, just to be for more transparency purposes, yes, it would be up to the member of council to make sure that those extra compensations that they do receive from the boards and committees is forwarded to us for posting. Okay, I'll leave it for now. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, uh, $50 a month per for counselors for transportation, is that captured just with our regular pay? Is that on our pay stuff? I don't look at my pay stuff, so just a question. Um, I would actually, it looks like Councillor Harris was nodding in the affirmative, so in terms of that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was actually captured somewhere. Um, and then I just wanted to agree with some of the comments that have been made about uh, the ability to claim per diems uh, for council committees that don't pay them otherwise out of your per diem budget. All committees are not created equally and some 
are a lot more work than others. And if you combine one member of council happening to get a couple of those committees that don't pay per diems and uh, they're high, a high workload committee, then um, that can be quite a lot of them. So I do, um, I do appreciate that. And I do think that there needs to be something looked at there as to how to make it more clear for council to uh, claim out of their per diem budget for those expenses. Um, but I do also agree with Councillor Lennox that there has to be some accountability. And I suppose that comes out of our budgets. I mean, there is the accountability that it is in our budgets, which are posted online. So um, I'm not really sure what the solution to that is, but um, just trusting members of council is one thing. I, I mean, I do trust my members of my members of council, but um, I don't know if there was any ideas for how to make that more transparent, then I would be open to that as well. Um, around again, uh, I can't see everyone, so I'll just go to Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. I'm back to being organized. Uh, the point, one of the points I wanted to touch, Councillor Harris raised it. Um, he mentioned 3.8B. I'd just refer, I suppose, Ms. Moulter to 3.6 and 3.7. So there seems to be a built-in inconsistency in there, again, touched on by Councillor Harris. Uh, 3.6 says you have to be at a meeting for six hours of length or longer, and yet 3.7a says that a half day per diem is defined as being from two to four hours. When would we ever collect a 2.2 to four hour per diem? I don't know if I've ever received one. I'm not saying I haven't, don't know if I have. Uh, your worship to, to sorry, not your worship. <laughs> um, to Councillor Kelly. That could be for um, any other types of events that you do attend. Um, so uh, let's see, some examples could be um, some training, um, some training that you've attended that's between two and four hours. You could claim a per diem for that. Um, the six hours was meant really for anything that was longer uh, than the typical council meetings, so the budget meetings that are all day long. Um, but any of the other uh, activities that you attend, maybe you attend something that you represent council, and it is within that period of time, you could uh, you could um, submit a request for a per diem between those hours. Does that, does that help to make sense? No, I'm sorry, but it absolutely doesn't. 3.6 is very clear. Council meetings, board meetings, commission meetings, um, where councillors have been appointed when the meeting is six hours in length or longer, which doesn't give me any room to receive a half day per diem because the budget meetings you referenced, of course, are, are council meetings. And I'll leave it at that. The point is that I think this policy needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, I don't want to beat that up anymore. And like Councillor Macon, I've not ever looked at a payslip because you long ago gave me my password to look at that stuff and I long ago lost it. Uh, and the checks, by the way, get deposited directly to my wife's bank account, so I never even see them. So, but 2.4 says that council gets an annual COLA increase based on an inflation rate. Have we in fact received that? Uh, through your worship, uh, or through the chair to to Councillor Kelly, I believe um, Ms. and Ms. Fitzsimmons can can have the specific numbers. Oh, there she is. Um, but I believe in 2019 would have been the cola, and in 2020 there was not colas applied, or in 2021 across the organization. That is correct. So we did receive a bump one time. Okay, that answers the question because that was the first I was aware of it. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. That covers my questions and my points. Thank you. And I'll just uh, pause from the rotation for a second. I think Mr. Fleming wanted to make some comments. Um, to you, Madam Chair, this it, this was from like ten minutes ago, so I might be dated already. But uh, just to the to the notion of accountability, I just I thought maybe there was some confusion um, with respect to members of council posting the honorariums and per diems they get from outside commissions, that is the responsibility of the member of council. And 
the accountability really would lie with, I would say with council, we don't police that. And I remember when there was a, when the motion was made, I want to say 2015 or 16, when we started doing that, there was a pretty rich conversation at the time about how was that going to get tracked? And it was, it was widely agreed by the council that council would kind of police themselves and council would be responsible for it with respect to the per diems that the city provides. Um, administration does work with members of council to make sure that those per diems are consistent with the city's policy. Are they eligible or not? And if there's sort of a disagreement or confusion or whatnot, um, we would work it out with the member of council. And if, and if that didn't happen, then it would get brought to council's attention for, um, for sort of a decision, I guess, um, as to whether or not the per diem was eligible, which I don't believe we've had to do this term. I think we've, we've always. If we pointed out a few times that a that a per diem up, uh, wasn't eligible, the member of council withdrew it. So there hasn't been any issues this term. So there is accountability on the city's per diems, and it's on council for the outside uh, per diems honorary. Thank you, Mr. Fleming. Uh, it's to you, Councillor Abatoy. So help me understand. Um, I sit on the water commission, um, water, um, water commission, and they send me a check for a per diem for my per diem. But they don't send it that they don't send it directly to me. They send it to the city, so the city actually opens that check and put it in my bin. So to me, that's the city already knowing that I've been paid a per diem. So am I expected to now come back to the city who opened the check to say that? Oh, by the way, I got this per diem from the Water Commission. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I don't. All of the boards and commissions are different, so maybe if unless Miss Exley has a, a comment on that, then um, I would have to get back to you on on our procedure with the Water Commission specifically. Um, Councillor Abatoy, through. Uh... Uh, Madam Chair, um, I think with regard to the Water Commission, things have been uh, pretty clearly uh, displayed on the website with regard to um, compensation for those. Um, copies of checks have been supplied to me. So, um, again, it, it's each councillor, it's their accountability to ensure that I have that information and it, it is posted. Thank you for the clarification. Councillor Harris. I think I can clarify. Um, I've, uh, I guess, been the beneficiary of being on uh, the wastewater com uh, commission. And so what would happen is um, I would get a monthly uh, statement for what we would get. And um, um, I typically wouldn't bring them in and give them to Cheryl every month, but uh, Cheryl would have to, to go back. And uh, the last time that I gave her a, uh, I, I gave her about six months worth, and she put them all on on the um, on the account for my reconciliation, if you will. Um, now I've probably got a couple of months left to bring forward and to have her do that again. Um, everything that I had uh, received from the MRB, for example, on any of the things, those would have been handled in the same way. So those. Um, and I know some members of council have gone in, or at least uh, I'm aware that some members of council have gone in to check or to look or whatever. It doesn't matter. But uh, you know, I've tried to approach those so that we, uh, so that I have adhered to the to the policy. And uh, you know, it's not on a monthly basis now. Uh, now being on the water commission, what I find is that all you get is a check, and you don't get a permission stub. All you get is a check. So with the wastewater commission, they would give you both, they give you a remission stub and then the remission stub is what would be uh, given to Mrs. Exley and she would, she would place onto the, um, onto the uh, website accordingly. So that's the way it's uh, been handled, uh, the way I've seen it in the past. And I think that worked quite well. And those are the only two that I think I was uh, involved in. The wastewater, now the water commission, but the water commission, I guess we have to figure that one out it's a little bit different so i think there's adherence to the policy from that standpoint now we can all 
you know, uh, knowledge in our own context, how we're handling it. And that's how I've been handling it for your information. Thanks, Councillor Harris. I'll go to Councillor Sperling. I don't have any specific comments. I get, I guess it's just a general comment. Um, during a, the initial council orientation, is there, um, I don't recall seeing it in the past when I've been through it, but is there a, is there an orientation that includes um, council's remuneration and expenses policy? Like, I think even the group that's here, we've been in the, We've been on council now this term for you know going into our fourth year, um, you know, and there's still some doubt, maybe a few shadows there about what we should be doing and and maybe what we aren't doing. Uh, is that something that is included in the council orientation, or is it something that could be added to the orientation? Just to be clear, uh, through the chair to uh, to Councilor Sperling, I definitely could if it needs more emphasis. I, I Miss Exley can. <laughs> Can respond to this one as well. I know Ms. Exley does one on one sessions with each member of, of, of council prior to the orientation. And I'm not sure if she touches on, on some of this, but if it needs needs more emphasis on in the part of the old formal orientation, we can certainly do that as well. Okay. Thank you. Nope, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Councillor Lennox. Uh, nothing further, thanks. Um, I don't know, my screen is being funny. I can't see everybody. I see Councillor Kelly with his hand up, so we'll just go through one more time. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to share my experience with, with um, the Water Commission for three years. I'm not at all certain that Jennifer picks up that check, Councilor Abitoy, and takes a copy of it uh, when it shows up. I know she always asked me for a copy or a picture of it to report it. So you might check with her on how she handles it. Um, and you could also obviously check the website and see if they're getting reported on your behalf. But well, I believe Cheryl just responded already. She always gets a copy of the check. Well, thank you, but I'm telling you what, what uh, Jennifer does in the three years that I was on it. So, so as long as it's handled, that's great. I'm just giving you a heads up that if Jennifer's looking after it, it might not be the procedure. Councillor Abitoy, anything further? No, I'm good, thank you. Great, Councillor Harris, I can't see you if you're waving. Uh, no, I have nothing more. Thanks. Great. Councillor Sperling. To go. Good. Uh, Mayor Ketcher, I can no longer see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm good to go. I was good last time. Okay. And Councillor Lennox, anything? Sorry, right. I can't see you. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. It always seems like the person who's up next disappears from my screen. So. Um, so with that, I think we are done that one and we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, does anyone need a comfort break? It's been about an hour and a bit. Yeah, okay, a few people. So uh, we'll say seven minutes, come back 7.50. Please turn off your videos and your microphone.
Okay, if I have to get, get everyone to start coming on with their video. Now I'm seeing more people than before, but can I just ask if Councillor Abitoy is on? And I'm just not seeing her. I am. Darn, darn it, I've been playing with settings this whole seven minutes. I I had everyone and now all of a sudden I don't. So I'm not sure what little technology elf got into my computer. So sorry about that. Um, we'll move on to the next item which is sorry i have to move this up number eight commercial vehicle enforcement report and i seen that we have kareen rayner and lee hardman here to present all right good evening uh madam chair and members of council my name is kareen rayner and i am the director of protective services for the city with me i have sergeant lee hardman to help me answer any questions you may have at the conclusion of my presentation. I will be presenting information on commercial vehicle and dangerous goods enforcement within the city of Port Saskatchewan. In December of 2020, council passed a notice of motion that the city of Port Saskatchewan engage with the correct authorities to provide an overview of the province's dangerous goods program and commercial vehicle enforcement including how to train for and deliver the program to ensure a safe and uniform approach to handling and transportation of dangerous goods through our community and further that the report be brought back at the end of the first quarter of 2021. This presentation will highlight the various agencies who are responsible for commercial vehicle and dangerous goods enforcement. Through consultation with these agencies, we have made great headway in the development of our own per commercial vehicle enforcement program. I have engaged the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance Program Coordinator with the Alberta Highway uh, Sheriff Highway Patrol Unit and the Chief Inspector of Dangerous Goods and Rail Safety Unit with Alberta Transportation. They have helped us to understand how these agencies provide this service. Our municipal enforcement unit has added Sergeant Lee Hardman, who is a level one CVSA inspector. Sergeant Hardman has experience in commercial vehicle enforcement, and he is leading the way at enhancing our program. It is up to the city um, to decide on what the service level will be uh, when it comes to commercial vehicle enforcement. And municipal enforcement will be the primary unit responsible for delivering this, this service in our municipality. I have also cons consulted with Inspector Mike McCulley with the RCMP to help inform us of the RCMP's role when it comes to commercial vehicle enforcement for the RCMP. To begin with, um, the Alberta Sheriff Branch uh, is the lead agency for the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance Program in Alberta. So that is the CVSA program that you will hear me refer to. They are the administrator of the commercial vehicle enforcement program and provide us with policy direction, training, certification, and monitoring of all of the commercial vehicle safety alliance inspectors. The Alberta sheriffs have the authority to enforce on any provincial roadway. They typically stay on the provincial highways outside of our municipal boundaries. The Alberta Sheriff's Highway Patrol Unit will come into our jurisdiction if invited to do so and assist us with our joint force operations um, like we, we did earlier in the fall of last year. Then we have the Alberta Transportation Dangerous Goods and Rail Safety Unit. They provide education and enforcement to industry carriers of dangerous goods. 
one of their main roles is to conduct facility inspections of provincially regulated railways, as well as other facilities housing dangerous goods. This unit provides technical support to emergency response teams at dangerous goods incidents, and they provide advice to industry for dangerous goods compliance. They do provide assistance to enforcement agencies by providing a training course for on highway dangerous goods inspections. The dangerous goods and railway safety unit can assist us upon request on our larger vehicle commercial vehicle traffic enforcement operations. However, they typically do not operate patrol vehicles to conduct on road traffic stops. The dangerous good and rail safety unit are available for emergency emergency responses and they are the subject matter experts to help enforcement personnel with interpretive compliance information on the technical aspects of the transportation of dangerous goods legislation. The city has entered into two memorandum of understanding agreements with Alberta Transportation and with Alberta Justice and Sol Solicitor General Sheriff's Department. The first MOU was signed in 2018 with Alberta Transportation for the purposes of public safety of dangerous goods in our municipality. This MOU is essential for our community peace officers to be able to conduct dangerous goods enforcement within our municipality. The MOU is essential for Alberta Transportation to provide a training course at no cost to our officers so that they can be designated on highway dangerous goods inspectors. The MOU also provides that Alberta Transportation will provide technical support to our officers on appropriate emergency response procedures for the product and substances that is legislated under the Dangerous Goods Act. To date, we do not have any of our community peace officers um, trained as an on highway dangerous goods inspector. The second MOU is with the Alberta Justice and Solicitor General, the Sheriff Highway Patrol unit, which was signed in February of this year. This MOU allows our community peace officers to participate in the North American Standard Inspections Program. The Alber Alberta Solicitor General Sheriff's Branch out of Leduc is teaching this course and we are on the waiting list to receive this training potentially for one more officer on our team. The MOU is a working agreement which outlines the requirements for training, minimum number of, ex of inspections to maintain the certification, um, and the application of the CVSA decals and the North American standard out of service criteria which we must follow. With these signed MOUs, we are provided training at no cost by these provincial agencies. Basic commercial vehicle training is also provided by the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers. And these are four day training courses at a cost of $500 each that are available to us. Um, weights and dimensions is one of them, which we do have two officers that are currently trained in weights and dimensions and cargo securement is another one of those courses. The second would be the dangerous goods on highway inspector certification training, which is pro provided to us at no cost from the Alberta Transportation Dangerous Goods and Rail Safety Unit. This certification is to conduct enforcement under the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act. And then finally, we have the CBSA inspector level one course, which is provided at no cost by the Alberta Sheriff branch out of Leduc. This course involves two weeks of training that an officer will go to. And um, this will allow for one of our community peace officers to conduct full mechanical inspections for commercial vehicles. For the RCMP's role, many years ago, the RCMP was involved in commercial vehicle enforcement and did have inspectors doing this type of work. The officer in charge of the K Division Highway Patrol Program has informed us that they have moved away from this type of enforcement due to the requirements to maintain the certification. And with they have members that transfer every three to five years 
it just wasn't an efficient way to keep up with this type of um, enforcement. The focus of the RCMP High River Patrol Unit is to do regular traffic enforcement with the focus on intel gathering, interdiction of the transportation of illegal items, and with the new zero tolerance laws for impaired driving under Bill 21, these are their main focus areas when it comes to traffic enforcement. Our city of Fort Saskatchewan RCMP currently have three officers in our traffic and crime reduction unit. Their focus is similar to uh, with the traffic safety and crime reduction goals as the K Division Highway Patrol program. Municipal enforcement services and our community peace officers hold the responsibility in our municipality to conduct commercial vehicle enforcement since 2019. This is a specialized skill that involves extra training and dedication that is currently added on to their other general duty responsibilities, such as bylaw enforcement, animal control, automated traffic enforcement, provincial legislation, and conventional traffic enforcement as well. When this program began in 2019, the intent was for municipal enforcement officers to provide minimal level commercial vehicle enforcement and for us to evaluate the merit of hiring or training municipal enforcement staff to conduct more advanced inspections in future years. Our current service level has been in enhanced with the hiring of Sergeant Hardman, who is a CVSA level one inspector and has to conduct 32 inspections per year to maintain his certification. Two other officers that we have on staff are trained in weights and dimensions for commercial vehicles. We spend one to two shifts per month focused on commercial vehicle enforcement. And we do have plans to conduct joint force operations with the Sheriff Highway Patrol Unit and multiple other agencies such as Edmonton Police Service and Strathcona County. To date, a total of 67 tickets for, have been issued for commercial vehicle violations since 2019. This includes our joint force operation conducted with the sheriffs and other agencies in the fall of 2020. Sergeant Hardman is enhancing some of the basic training for commercial vehicle enforcement with our officers and has reserved us a spot to send one more um, community peace officer for training potentially this year. The level one CVSA inspections can take anywhere from 20 minutes to three hours to conduct, depending on the size and the defects of the vehicle. These intensive, intensive inspections take away from general duty responsibilities currently on our team. It is important to note that our comparator communities who have CVSA level one inspectors, they are a dedicated traffic officer typically and that is their main responsibility. There are only four communities out of 10 that responded to our request in our region that take on CVSA level one inspections within their municipality. And this is typically a dedicated traffic officer with this responsibility. If council should choose to increase the compliance checks for commercial vehicle and dangerous goods going through our community, there are a few options that I've provided to you to increase this service level. One of the options is to increase the number of inspections performed per year. Currently, Sergeant Hardman has to conduct 32 of these inspections. And if we do train one more officer to become a level one inspector, that will increase to 64 inspections per year. The second option to increase this service level would be to add 0.5 of an FTE to our municipal enforcement complement um, to a so that we can use casual and relief officers to respond to general duty calls for service. And then we can have our commercial vehicle trained uh, enforcement officers focus on, on commercial vehicle enforcement a bit more. A third option is to increase um, our level of staffing by one FTE so that we have a dedicated traffic and commercial vehicle enforcement officer whose main role would be to increase traffic safety and commercial vehicle and dangerous goods compliance within our municipality. 
with the municipal enforcement capacity and service level review coming back to council in June, recommendations based on your feedback tonight can be made at that time as to how we can move forward with commercial vehicle enforcement, either by maintaining our service level that we currently have or by increasing it. I would like to have you to have a good understanding of what the CVSA level one inspection is and how it will increase compliance and public safety on the roadways in our community. The North American standard inspection is a 37 step inspection that involves determining the vehicle if the vehicle driver is proper, properly licensed and qualified to drive, if the driver is fit and able to drive, and that the vehicle is in safe mechanical condition. These level one inspections do increase the commercial vehicle and dangerous goods level of safety compliance while traveling through the city. Why do we need these types of inspections being done in our municipality? Port Saskatchewan has adopted Vision Zero as our traffic safety mindset that our long-term goal is to have zero fatalities and major injury collisions on our roadways. Traffic safety within our community is a priority for the residents that live here and travel on our roadways. In 2019, there were 45 people killed and 604 injuries injured in collisions involving commercial vehicles in Alberta. A dangerous goods incident has been deemed one of our highest risk of emergency management in our community. Our city is in the industrial heartland with many industrial and chemical plants as our close neighbors. And we have a dangerous goods on highway 15 and 21, a dangerous goods route 15 and 21 coming through our city with hundreds of commercial vehicle and dangerous goods carriers traveling on our roads, roadways, which does pose a risk for public safety in our community. Protective Services has made headway in increasing our commercial vehicle enforcement program. And with our municipal enforcement capacity and service level review, recommendations can come back at that time to council as to whether to maintain or to increase our service level. This concludes my presentation and I'm Lee and I are available to answer any of your questions. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, just a point of clarification, I skipped myself on round one last time, which is why we ended up with Councillor Kelly. So it is in fact still Councillor Kelly's turn to start. So Councillor Kelly, you may go. Well, thank you for that. Um, but you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll wait my turn and go last. So, so who's ever next up, we'll put them on the spot, Madam Chair. <laughs> no problem, Councillor Abitoy. I was born ready. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, um, Corinne, for your presentation, and, and it's good to see you as well, Inspector Hardman. Um, so the in the um, commercial vehicle inspections that were done last year, I know that um, um, the report we got was that over ninety percent of the vehicles that were inspected were actually issued tickets, and um, I thought that was alarming, and was very um, pleased that the motion was brought forward. Um, but my question, though, is what what was the condition of those vehicles? What was it? Can you, can you just tell us a little, a little more about the conditions of the vehicle? Was it like like little things here and there, or was it was it like major things that could really put our community in harm's way? Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, through to Councillor Abitoy. So there were 20 vehicles pulled over in a three hour time period during that operation. And 16 of those vehicles were issued violations. Some of them were minor um, windshield wipers not working properly. There was an overweight um, vehicle, a water truck. So there, there were minor in nature. Um, some of them were taken out of service for a short period of time. And I think we had, yeah, we did have 16 violations in that three hour period. Okay, thank you. So well, my, my question though was about like the gravity of the conditions. Was it was were they were they mostly minor things or were they major issues that like that could that could put us in in um, put our community in risk? 
Sure, Madam, Madam Chair, Chair, through to Councillor Abitoy. Go ahead, Lee, if you'd like to uh, comment on that. Sorry, Madam Chair, through to Councillor Abitoy. Um, I wasn't here in 2020 when, when this operation was taking place, but I have looked at the reports. Um, violations such as loose loads, which which Corrine mentioned there, poses a significant risk to the community. If if any if I, any items got dislodged from a, from a vehicle, that could have, that could potentially hit another vehicle. That could cause that could cause a fatal collision. Um, anything from loose brakes, uh, shock absorbers, for example, on a, for a me mechanical defect on a truck, those were items that were found. Um, those could pose a significant risk to the driver and to to our residents using the roadways as well. Okay, thank you, thank you for that response. Um, so. Obviously, this is this is something that's really major. Um, we have lots of commercial vehicles going through our community, and that's that's why we need to ensure that um, we have the right resources. Um, so, my second question is because um, you said option one will be training our current resources that we have. Um, what what does that do for us? Would I, I mean if it's probably better if we got like a full one, a full time um, person. But I'm just wondering, like, with the current resources we have, are we able to still tackle the issue of um, commercial vehicle and dangerous goods? Madam Chair, through to Councillor Abatoy, it is um, an added responsibility onto officers, and it does take away from calls for service. Um, yeah, it's just depending. And I think that, you know, we're we're in the beginning stages too of doing our municipal enforcement capacity review to really take a look at all of our service levels. And we'll be bringing that back to council to really have a more in-depth look at um, all of our service levels and our resources that we currently have. And we will have a better idea for you as to, to um, how we can move forward at that time. Thank you, Ms. Reyna. Uh, Councillor Harris, you are up. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report, uh, Ms. Rayner, um, Mr. Hardman. Um, I, I think safety is of paramount uh, concern to all members of council and in our community as a whole. So thank, thank you for the information from that standpoint. We're not making a decision tonight. Um, and so I guess the question that I would have for uh, the city manager is, when is this going to come forward? as Ms. Rayner just said, when are we going to actually have the opportunity to sit down and ask the questions at the time that we're gonna be making the decision? Uh, because it's not tonight. This is good background information and I respect that Councillor Sperling had originally brought this up, if memory serves me correctly. I think it's really important, but I'm at a loss because I'm not sure which way to go other than we can say we need to ensure that we have the right level of service to ensure that the motoring public in our community, local and otherwise, are safe and secure. Um, I was in the city of Edmondson this morning, uh, driving on, I think, 186th Street, and there was a semi uh, with a large trailer, and he had a load of pipe that was definitely not secured properly. It was moving well off center, center axis, and I'm surprised those pipes stayed on there. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my wife said, just stay away from that guy. And I said, yeah, you got that one. So, and I'm sure that goes on all the time. But so my question to the administration, when are we going to actually need to make a decision on this? And is this some of the information or is there other information we need to make an informed decision? Yeah, th through you, Madam Chair, I would, my, what my recommendation to council would be is to give us your kind of thoughts and your initial reaction on this report. And then when we come back for the capacity, because there are two parts of this, um, uh, dangerous goods enforcement and, and this heavy vehicle inspection work has been a struggle for the for the city for quite some time. And I do, I, I do believe strongly that a, a large part of that is because we simply don't have the capacity to keep up with the demands we've put on the current con, um, complement of officers. As soon as you're, as soon as somebody's sick or there's turnover, the first thing to go is the proactive inspection type of work that we're talking about tonight. And so, I what we're looking for from council tonight is just your initial reaction on on this these options, and then when we come back, 
um, for the next discussion on department capacity. Perhaps that that's when we can get into council making recommendations on what I would say is what to what to inform into the 2022 budget deliberations. Um, although I think in our evaluation, the the highest level of enforcement here, the third option actually becomes a cost neutral option. It's it's more a question of do you want um, that sort of level of intensity of enforcement? But I would say for now, it's just an initial reaction on this, and then there'll be a part two to this conversation. Yeah, and I, I think the way I look at it, uh, it's a service level decision that we have to make in context to all the other decisions we have to make within a budgetary context. And obviously, Councillor Lennox has many years of experience with an enforcement related background. Uh, and I'm sure she has something to say. Councillor Sperling has obviously brought this forward. Um, so I would definitely want to hear the comments of uh, all the colleagues on council uh, so we can sit down and make the best informed decision. I mean, we have to be concerned about cost. Um, obviously, one of your options showed, uh, I, and I wouldn't say making money, but ultimately covering the cost uh, with a little bit of revenue um, generation out of it. But I don't think that's, the, I, I wouldn't see that as the most important thing. I see, how do we ensure the safety of, of people in our community? And if this is the way to do it, then I think we need to have a fulsome discussion. So that would be my saying. I, I, I couldn't make a decision right now tonight based on what I've seen. I'd have to chew it over for a while personally. Councillor Sperling. Thanks for the presentation, Corrine, and, uh, and your comments, Lee. You know, I think Fort Saskatchewan is, a, is somewhat unique even though we're not the biggest player in the region, I think the makeup of our community and the the close surrounding area make, you know, the situations in our community probably a little more heightened in terms of traffic safety. Now, I, you know, I'm really curious if we've ever done a traffic count on commercial or dangerous goods vehicles that travel through our community, even on a, in one day, what would that volume of traffic be? And and so that's that's one of the things I would I would suggest is a measure. I think that simply the fact that we're establishing a protocol or a, a regular routine around dangerous goods inspections and commercial vehicle inspections sends a signal. I think that sends a signal to the you know the industrial commercial vehicle community that that uh, we are checking. That that if you're driving through town, if you're going to drive through our town, there's a good chance you could at some point uh, receive an inspection. So I think I think that's that's a great measure. When I look at uh, your presentation in terms of some options in in adding additional manpower, in some cases uh, the, there's a full time position that appears to be cost neutral. That your cost of of the position is uh, covered through the Fine revenue. There's there's some real strong background noise. Anyways, there's a that it's a cost neutral position. You hire a new position, the fine revenue that's generated through the position is enough to, to carry the cost. I think that's one was one of your presentation points, Kareem. Um, Madam Chair, oh, were you? Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was uh, sorry, Councillor Sperling. I was just going to answer one of your questions. So I read. Sure. Uh, a report um, from 2017 regarding commercial vehicles going through Highway 15 and 21. And there was over 2,000 vehicles per day traveling through that intersection. So that was one of the, the questions that you had had. So that was in 2017. Right. Um, yes, and adding one full-time position that is a dedicated traffic officer will certainly increase the compliance checks that we have going through the community um, daily. So that is uh, a, a good step forward if we wanna really focus on commercial vehicles and dangerous goods. When you look at the, you know, the resources that you can put into this, into this you're gonna, you can reach a point of diminishing return on the investment. But I think just establishing the program for now, getting some additional manpower to support it, I think is, is, is a good message for the community and for the region. So I'll leave it at that for now. 
Thank you, Mayor Kitcher. Okay, thank you very much. So if I recall, uh, Vision Zero Council adopted Vision Zero in, I think it was 2018, if I recall. And when that was brought forward to Council, um, I thought there was a request at that point in time for a full-time position. Do you recall that, Kareen or Troy? I, mm -hmm. Yes, through you, Madam Chair, I do recall. I, I can't remember the nature of the ask, but there was an ask for um, uh, dangerous goods enforcement um, in 2018. Sounds sounds about right. Is that okay. 18 or 19? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. through your worship, that is correct. In 20 in the 2019 budget process, we did receive one additional officer, and as a part of that ask. We were going to increase the level of commercial vehicle enforcement at that time by getting the some basic level training for that officer at that time. It kind of was hand in hand with um, the commercial vehicle enforcement program uh, plan request that came forward as well at the same time. Okay, but um, I thought I recalled, and I don't know, and anybody can refresh my memory afterwards. I thought. When Vision Zero was initially or originally presented to Council, there had been a request for a full time position and it was determined at that point in time. No, uh, majority of Council said, no, it was, you know, uh, we didn't need full time at that point in time. But I also don't recall it uh, talking about being revenue neutral. And uh, I think that's a very valid point that with the number of fines that could be received, um, or generate it, and you would hope that there isn't, but uh, uh, with the number of vehicles that do go through here, there is that potential for it. And uh, so I'm just going to confirm though, um, and I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Fleming, don't go away. So on option one, is it just asking for 110,000 and not talking about the revenue neutral to bring a new person on? And then option three is just um, using the existing staff and saying it's revenue neutral. And I ask that question because if you use existing staff, what falls off? So that's to both of you. Um, yeah, through you, your worship, I'll let, um, I'll let Ms. Rayner go first on that and then I'll come in second. I just need to refresh my memory on the, the nature of the options. Yep, yeah, sure, through to your worship. So the option to have, um, a half-time FTE would would what what that would entail is us allowing us to just bring on our existing casual relief staff that we have for community peace officers and bring them on to assist with the general duty calls so that things don't fall off um, like you're referring to and that the trained commercial vehicle officers can then just focus on commercial vehicle on those days. Um, that was one of the options that we provided. Um, out of the three options, one that we like are maintaining a kind of our current service level, we have Inspector Hardman who can who will be conducting 32 of these inspections per year. And then the other option was adding the full time position. So okay. and there would be there, the, the cost neutral would be in adding a half time solution is that we would be generating more tickets um, by doing more enforcement on those days. Okay, thank you. So I know I supported it uh, back in 2018 when it was brought forward because I felt personally at that point in time, you can't have um, municipal enforcement officers doing it off the side of their desk and they do have to have that training. So it is very valuable. So I supported it back in 2018 and I would support either option one or option two at this point in time, whatever we deemed we could could afford at this point in time, because I do see it uh, as as valued for our community. So I'm just so I know you're looking for feedback tonight, Mr. Fleming. So um, I'm just leaving it with that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lennox. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, in regards to the 32 inspections that you need in order to maintain your CBSA um, designation, now would those inspections be entirely in the city of Fort Saskatchewan or would you lend yourself out to um, other joint initiatives in the region? 
I can speak to that, Your Worship. Uh, sorry, Your um, to, to Councillor uh, Lennox. Um, so, with joint force operations, we can we would it's hand in hand. So we do go. We would assist other re regional partners as well, and we would almost expect that in return. So we would potentially go to neighboring municipalities as such as Edmonton or or Strathcona, but again. We would get that in return, but uh, for the most part, I would say 98% of the time they would be within the city boundaries. And 98% of the time they would be within city boundaries, did you say? That's correct. <clears throat> um, Okay, and just uh, Kareem, if you could follow up on what um, data or evidence or information are you um, referring to when you say that a half time position would be um, paid for itself? Through your chair to Councillor Lennox. So, by a half time position, what I'm meaning is to add in. Um, casual casual staffing dollars so that we can bring on and have our casual relief community peace officers assist us on days where Sergeant Hardman and say one of the other trained CVE officers would go out and conduct that type of enforcement so that we can keep up with our calls for service and pro other proactive work that's happening around the city. So the halftime position, it's not like we would just hire um, like a half time position to conduct conversion commercial vehicle enforcement. It's that we would util be able to have budget dollars to utilize our casual relief staff so that the trained officers can do that type of work. And we do have a complement of 2 casual relief community peace officers on staff right now. Okay, and so what I'm just wondering what the philosophy is. Um, from the perspective of having specifically trained a um, couple of individuals versus having a wider um, range of training amongst all the members in order to deal with situations as they arise, instead of waiting to have to call someone or you know find or, or an accident or something like that. So just wondering um, why the designated people as opposed to having more general um, tools, I guess, over over more people. Madam Chair, through to Councillor Lennox, I think that the, it's just the training that is involved in in um, commercial vehicle and dangerous goods enforcement is quite in, it's quite intensive. And to to train all eight of our officers in that, I don't think is an efficient use of our time. And then with staff turnover, and things for them to have that general knowledge of, of commercial vehicle, which we will bring up. Sergeant Hardman has been training them in doing specific things, but just the type, even the, the, the weights and measures and cargo securement is a four day course to take, send all of our officers to take that training. So that's why we've chosen just within our team initially to train a few officers to do that. And then they are assigned specific dates to uh, go out and do that type of enforcement. Sergeant Hardman, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I can add to that, uh, your chairman, through to Councillor Lennox. Um, to get this training for a community peace officer, it is a specialized training, as Kareen mentioned. Um, by the time you've got this training, you're probably looking at close to a year to be certified in, in CVSA inspections. And again, spending all those resources on our entire complement of staff would take them off the road to, uh, of course, do proactive bylaw enforcement and other traffic enforcement within our city. So that would be the rec why we made that uh, distinction for a, potentially a traffic officer for, for that. So. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean for all of them to be trained in CBSA, um, but the other dangerous goods and commercial vehicle enforcement went to measures and that kind of thing. So um, my, own, my other concern is retention is in having the training and especially the CVSA, I would think that it's probably fairly um, wanted throughout the region. 
And I think that perhaps maybe the report that is coming next will shed some some light on that. But I do agree with Councillor Harris's comments in that any increases in service level need to be discussed at budget, um, just like everything else. So thank you again for the report. Councillor Lennox. Uh, um, I've always been very supportive of um, funding for commercial vehicle enforcement. Uh, anything that's come forward to this council in this term, I have supported. Um, uh, I've mentioned before uh, my own dad's experience with commercial vehicles with Edmonton Police Service, and I just think uh, what I've learned um, having long talks with him and our transportation infrastructure and the way it's set up running through our community and just the sheer amount um, of commercial traffic coming through uh, 2000 a day, uh, four years ago, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if that number was double now or at least 50% higher than that. So um, I really truly believe that it's prudent to this community to take that seriously and to put funding towards that, especially when we are looking at a funding that request that could pay for itself. Um, I think that there is the risk is very high and um, that this is important that we take a look at this and increase the service level uh, as soon as we can. So uh, for my feedback on this, obviously, I'm very highly supportive of this still. I prefer option one, um, but I would be happy with it any level of increase that we can get to um, help with the safety of our community. And with that, I will move to you, Councillor uh, Kelly. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your report, folks. Um, by way of introduction, generally, I'm in favor of increased enforcement. Corinne, uh, you mentioned four earlier in your presentation, you mentioned, I think, four communities that have an enhanced level of enforcement in this area. Can you give us a list of those communities? If it's in the report, I missed it. Madam Chair, through to Councillor Kelly, I sure can. It's uh, Leduc, Edmonton Police Service has their own commercial vehicle uh, traffic enforcement unit. Strathcona County and Wetaskiwin have the CBSA level one inspectors on their staff. And I do note some similarities between Certainly, with Duke's traffic flow and Fort Saskatchewan's traffic flow. Um, with Tasquin, I'm not sure, um, but nonetheless, there's some similarities. I would point out the council, the comments you provided in your report on page 112, where it talks about the enforcement operations and some of the violations that were found. An overloaded water truck um, it depends on the amount of the overload before I get concerned about it as a citizen. But the next four bullet points cause me some serious concern. Driving in the rain without a driver's side wiper. Um, I've tried that once and I used to ride a motorcycle with a visor and when it started to rain, it became impossible to drive. Uh, multiple units with service brakes inoperative on the trailer. Uh, if the trailer is is 500 pounds and the truck weighs 10,000, that may or may not be a problem. But if the trailer is 20,000 or more pounds, which most of them will be, that is a significant problem and a serious risk to everybody on the road. Um, loose tie rod bolt, broken and separated leaf spring and pack. Um, that's the type of stuff I fear on the road in any vehicle, let alone one that weighs 80,000 pounds. Dual tires, this one blows my mind. Dual tires coming in contact with each other. Uh, I don't even know how that could happen, but that would cause me infinite alarm if I were to, to see that. So, so I support coming back to, to budget with, with, with a program of service that you would recommend. I recall the conversation in the budget deliberations of a few years ago this data wasn't available when we had those deliberations, so those deliberations took a different turn for sure. Since that time, of course, we've also had a, an unfortunate accident a year or so ago in Fort Saskatchewan on the highway where somebody was killed. And more recently, a couple incidents in the city of Edmonton where some serious damage was done 
And I think one individual ended up um, dead as well, if memory serves me correct. Uh, and it's, it's that type of stuff that, that we need to be on top of. I'm not gonna refer to it as revenue neutral. In no way, shape or form do I want to suggest to the community that we're doing this to raise money. We are doing this for safety, period. The fines are incidental and the fines will be what the fines will be. Um, and just one yeah. final comment. I spent two decades logging many miles on a motorcycle around North America. And one of the first lessons I learned is when I got behind a heavy vehicle, I paid infinite attention and I never followed them closely. They are dangerous. And uh, I avoided them normally by passing them as fast as I could. Sorry, Sergeant, but as fast as I could to get the heck out of harm's way to create my own space. So I support something serious on this. Um, I, whatever you folks deem necessary, I think you'd find that um, if I were on council, certainly next fall, I would support it wholeheartedly. So thank you for the report and I look forward to getting at this again. I think you mentioned in, in May or June for an update and then again at budget time. Look forward to it. Miraculously, I have everyone on my screen. If I can just get a wave, if you have any more comments to make. See, oh, Kate, I will go to Councillor Sperling. It's actually not a question, it's just a comment, but you know, ultimately what could really help out the city in terms of uh, dangerous goods travel through the community is to not have it travel through the community, is to, is to create that bypass uh, uh, to move commercial traffic as much as we can uh, around the heart of the community and uh, avoid, you know, any possible uh, situations or incidents within the community. I I bring this up a lot, but it's in the transportation master plan that that um, I think it's a thirty year window from expanding Highway 15, but it talks about a two lane commercial bypass for, for commercial vehicles around Fort Saskatchewan. And I mean, ultimately, if we, if you could do one thing, it's not about hiring more officers, but if we can just move that traffic, have it go around the community versus through the community, I think that that would be enormous and maybe ultimately might be our, our obviously our safest uh, outcome uh, for the community. So. Um, I know Troy had said that uh, recently that the uh, that bypass is, has been pushed out further. I'm not sure how far that is or how, you know, when, when that might be on the horizon, but that would certainly be a good solution for the community as well. Not seeing any other hands up. Mr. Fleming, did you have any Finishing comments you want to make about what you've heard or next steps? Anything further from you? Um, to, or to you, Chair, I, what I take from this just at a high level is that um, this would most likely be uh, a conversation for the 2022 budget. Um, there does seem to be support from what I'm hearing for the, you know, the higher level option. We would want to validate our assumptions around um, the, the, if it's revenue neutral or not. Um, of course, and then just a reminder to council that we're actually scheduled to have another conversation about municipal enforcement where this will kind of be relevant again. Um, because one of the challenges around this type of enforcement has been the department's capacity to deliver on proactive enforcement, given their other responsibilities. So uh, we'll be talking about this again in the next few months. Great, thank you for your comments. Um, Mr. Hardman, Mrs. Rayner, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you. With that, uh, I'll move on. Are there any council inquiries? Not seeing any hands, although people are jumping around now on my screen. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, we're good. Um, so we are done with the items on the agenda, but we do have an in-camera portion to discuss matters that fall under FOIA. Um, Mayor Ketcher, can I get a motion to go in-camera? Thank you, I'll make the motion to go in-camera uh, to discuss matters that fall within one of the exceptions to disclosure under FOIA. 
Thank you. And the motion should be up on your screen. Close the motion, please cast your vote. So Ms. Exley, mine actually, um, my e-scribe went out. So I just vote yes. Perfect, I got it, thank you. Ms. Exley, did you get my vote? Oh yeah, you did, mine kicked me out as well. All right, thank you. So uh, we'll take a five minute break so we can transfer off of the live stream. Uh, so see you at 8.46. Hey, Leo, are you there? Leo, are you done? <laughs> 